Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 178, Reverse Engineering. Elements from video games we would love to see incorporated into the tabletop. I'm Sean, and here with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and working with you to make your game nights better. We record these episodes live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop, and it would be awesome if you joined us. So tonight we start with a longer than usual suggestion box. Then we've got a great question from one of our awesome Patreon patrons who heard us talking about being able to save in some board games, and they were wondering if there are any other video game features that we'd like to see translated to the tabletop. After that, we're going to review one of the hottest games of last year, Lost Ruins of Arnak. We wrap up with our usual week in review with two-player Scythe and even more Racco. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, a couple of comments on our Discover Lands Unknown unboxing video. Jay Barons writes, I had a lot of hope for this game, but it was terrible. And Yusuf Masudi says, yeah, we've played two scenarios so far, and they were both underwhelming. And then Ray Falk, Ray, uh, Falk Rooch commented, they had this technology left from Keyforge and didn't know what to do with it. Such a shame. Well, thanks for the comments, folks. Uh, there's definitely not a love out there for Discover Lands Unknown. Um, I will say, I don't I don't feel it's a leftover from Keyforge. I think both games were actually developed at the same time, and they're trying to do two different things with it. But so far for us, uh, Deanna and I have tried the first scenario in my box, and I know this matters. We had um, Plains and Bayou, if I remember correctly, are our two terrain types, because I've been told that certain terrain types are more fun than others, which possibly is one of the issues with the game. But I do have to admit, uh, due to comments like this, we weren't expecting much at all, to be honest. Um, but we were pleasantly surprised. It was actually quite fun. Now, the scarcity and the feeling of scarcity was really well done. And I love the feeling of exploration, not knowing what you're going to find. And I really did enjoy finding new things like, oh, this is tree and grab the card for the tree and find out what's in the tree. And some of it was like progressing past. That was actually pretty neat. And honestly, at this point, for the price we paid, which was under $10, I was not at all disappointed. Like, we had fun, that one game. 10 bucks, we had a good time. That's not bad for the two of us. Now, I am still looking forward to trying the other scenarios, and while well, maybe my opinion on the game will change after the next game. We'll have to wait and see. I, I have to wonder if people don't have a um, an issue like Charterstone on our hands, where people seem to be underwhelmed early, but it may just be designed to play out all the way through and they may be missing out by not enjoying the entire. Yeah, that's flow. possible though. I honestly, I have a real feeling that game three is going to be boring because it's like what it is, is your first game you play in one terrain, your next game you play in the other terrain, then your third game, you go back to the first terrain. Well, there's only so many tiles, like there's no new tiles. And when we played, we checked out every numbered spot. Like I'm not trying to spoil anything, So there's not going to be anything new to discover. It might be in different places, but I know in my copy of the game, I can get a suit of armor if I go to the tree because there's armor buried under that tree. And that's not spoiling anything because your copy, there's probably something <laughs> completely different under that tree. Um, so I know that's there. And we already know all of the items you can craft because we've crafted them all already. So I'm really concerned. Like game two, I think will be fun because we'll be in the bayou. It'll be all new cards, all new terrain, all new things to discover. But I have a feeling game three is going to be terrible. But I don't know. We'll see. All right, well. Now, uh, next, we have a number of comments on our Charterstone review from a few weeks back, starting with Alex McKenzie, who writes, Nice review. I'm glad you and your group enjoyed it. I really love the discovery aspect, breaking open those chests to see what cards would be added to the deck and what new mechanics would be thrown into the gameplay. However, because the discovery is what I enjoyed most, the Eternal mm. game fell super flat for me. Now, I agree what you, about what you said about the components. We also had to bend the cards to get the stickers off, yeah. which is super annoying. Mm -hmm. Luckily, after the bent card gets opened as a crate, the card is destroyed. So no harm, no foul, I suppose. We had the recipes get unlocked quite early, but it didn't okay. impact the game too much as we rarely have surplus goods. We mm. were all quite keen on building new buildings to improve that final score. Yeah. 
I'll be looking forward to the follow-up post about Charterstone Recharged. Well, thanks, Alex, for that that post uh, that you're looking for. The Charterstone Recharged post is going to be coming at some point. It ends up because this past weekend was uh, on a blank, free RPG day. Free RPG day, and we hit up one of our local game stores, the CG Realm, and while there, um, they had a copy of the Treasure Stone Recharge Pack, and I took a picture of it and sent a text to Tori and Cat, and like, yes or no, and they're like, hell yeah. So we now own a copy of the Treasure Stone Recharge Pack. Now I think it's going to be a little while before we get through the full thing a second time, um, especially because it's not an obligation anymore. So we'll get to it eventually, but we do have the first step. Well, next up, John Rear writes, Rear Rear writes. I have heard of folks covering the board with a sheet of vinyl and mounting the stickers onto vinyl so they don't ruin the board. Some mm. older gamers hate the idea of making permanent changes to a game board and try real hard to work around that. Well, thanks, John. But to me, this ruins the entire point of a legacy game. It's the fact that the actions you take have permanent, lasting effects that make these games so enjoyable to me. If you play in a way that this can be undone, you lose some of that impact. You're always going to know, well, we could always take it back. We could always erase it. We could always reset. We could always fix it. I love the permanence of not having that option, though to each their own. It's your game. Do with it what you want. But I recommend anyone playing any legacy game, just roll with it. Rip stuff up, write on things, fold things, bend things. It's all part of the experience. And honestly, you don't know what you're missing until you try it. The ripping of that first card is just like a freeing experience. Games are made to be fun. They're not meant to be investments. Enjoy your game. Well, Mo, you do delight in tearing up components more than many gamers. I oh, think. I don't know. I, I think most people enjoy it. They're just scared to do it for the first time. Now, finally, Jay Barons writes, the campaign was fun, but the end result was almost unplayable. Well, thanks, Jay. Uh, based on ours, and I, I, I'm sure different games probably end with different game states. I wouldn't call it unplayable. But it definitely wasn't all that. Uh, they, it was neat to get to try another charter, but it just, the game didn't matter. There were no stakes. There's no campaign. There's no carryover. There's no reason for me to try. And, and it just wasn't as enjoyable as playing any of the campaign games. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right, well, next we move on to our topic of crowdfunding red flags. First, we have Jason, wherever I may roll on Twitter with... Can you write a rule book? You can't even write a Kickstarter page. Oh, wow. Ouch. <laughs> Some great conversations in here. Yeah, we may have gotten a bit harsh during that topic, um, though it seems to be appreciated. So thanks, Jason. And Larry Hot writes, really appreciate the level of detail you two went into. Valuable tips for evaluating crowdfunding projects. Thanks much. Well, thanks, Larry. I got to say this topic has been proved to be rather popular. And honestly, I'm quite proud of that discussion we had. Yeah. Now we've got lots more in the mailbag, but let's mm -hmm. save some for later and wrap up with a couple of comments on our getting started with D&D topic from last week. Yeah. Now, somebody, M-K-R-A-W-E-C, writes, <laughs> I swear the essentials kit was worth the price for the plethora of dice alone. Also, what the heck? There are still Toys R Us in Canada? Yes. Canada's Toys R Us was a different corporation, and it never failed. Yeah, there's one here in Windsor, and it's still a great store. Um, now, like I got to say, that's a good point. I Again, Merrick, I'm guessing, is possibly how it's <laughs> pronounced. I apologize. We're getting that wrong. Um, the fact the essentials comes with a DM screen, dice, and maps. That alone could be worth it. Even if you never touch the rule book or ever run the adventure, just being able to get that stuff could be a very valid reason to buy that box set. And honestly, I've done the same thing, though for me it was the Fantasy Flight Edge of the Empire Star Wars games. I own all four of the box sets just to get me more of the unique dice required to play, and each one came with maps and counters that are just like great Star Wars stuff to have. Well, finally, we have Kevin Renault, the person who actually asked about D&D starter sets in the first place, who was cool enough to follow up with us and say, After watching this, I decided to start with the starter kit. When we get comfortable with playing, we'll move on to the essentials kit. Thanks for the recommendations. 
Oh, you're welcome, Kevin. And I think Sean and I both agree that the starter set was probably the best choice in your case. What I want to know is how it goes. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to Bo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. One quick announcement about our last giveaway before we move on to our main topic. The winner of our Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion, a Coded Chronicles game from the op is... Xanth W. Congratulations, Xanth. We'll get that game in the mail as soon as we can find a box that fits it. Yes, I should have planned that a little bit more ahead of time. We're here to answer your game gaming or game night questions. Tonight's question comes from Tabletop Bellhop patron Dr. Donna B, better known by the folk in the lobby and our Discord as Axanarian or Ax the Paladin. Now she asks, you've made me aware that you can save some tabletop games. Mm -hmm. The game provides a way to save the game state for resumption later. That's something that we're familiar with from video games, but is uncommon in other kinds of games. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder about other video game mechanics or video game experiences that could be incorporated after a fashion in board games. So my question is, if you could take anything you find particularly enjoyable or useful in video games and somehow translate it to board games, what would it be? This could be a kind of experience that you find pleasurable or a mechanic or functionality that would be interesting to bring to board games. Well, thanks for the great question, Donna. And of course, thanks for your long-term support of our show. Greatly appreciated. Now, I think this is a fascinating question. I think this is going to be a fun one to talk about tonight because there's video games and and tabletop games have taken an interesting, somewhat divergent, but sometimes overlapping path over the years uh, with concepts from one very much influencing the other. And I find it amazing nowadays is that sometimes you will have a video game based on a board game that's based on a video game that was based on a board game. And sometimes that goes full circle. Now, what a lot of people may not know and what I learned a lot from from industry friends of mine and people I talked to on Facebook, as well as um, some of the documentaries that have been on, say, Netflix on the video game history, is that there's one good reason for this tabletop game and video game overlap is that people often transfer from tabletop gaming into video gaming. For years, people who worked in the tabletop industry were basically scooped up by video game companies, mostly in the position of writers, writers and designers and adventure builders. They weren't the people doing the code, but they were the ones writing the story. There's actually a lot of the old TSR alumni who went on from their basic position of writing role-playing games into writing games like um, Might and Magic. I can't remember the name of who it was offhand. Now, recently, I've seen there's a move the other way where you have people from the video game world or even full on video game companies jumping into board gaming. And honestly, as time goes on, the line between the two types has become more and more blurred. Absolutely. Now, for many, this blurred line is a giant red flag. And we've had topics in the past that talk about the good and the bad that can come from mixing your analog and digital gaming together into one package. Now, while we don't share their opinion, many gamers still refuse to consider it a board game if it requires an app. Which I got to say is honestly somewhat ridiculous. While we do have some issues with apps for board games, especially obsolescence issues and things like the app stop working, the whole idea of blending the two honestly isn't a problem for me, and I find it kind of fascinating. It's the same people who also thought that Warhammer 3rd Edition was a board game, so wouldn't play it because it wasn't enough of a role-playing game. And to me, a a dated old view, and you know what? It's sometimes old dogs should try to learn new tricks. Now, even with the line blurring and more things from video games showing up on tabletops, our tabletops, and more tabletop things ending up in video games, there are still quite a few things that just off the top of my head, I would love to see more of. Yeah, certainly. Sharing ideas and concepts between things that are similar but different has always been a way to help both sides grow. Mm. This is true for arts, sciences, and yes, even games. So we don't have these in like a numbered list or anything like that. I just want to talk about a few things that I would love to see more of on the tabletop. And I'm going to start with the one Donna already mentioned, because I think it's an important one. 
that I would love to see more of, and that is the ability to save your game. Well, yes, there are a few games out there now that let you effectively save your game. They are few and far between. Now, Colonists is the first one that comes to mind. That was the first game that was like a big, heavy Euro game that literally had rules for how to save the game. Then there are also the Coded Chronicles games, most really like the Scooby-Doo game we gave away, that has you a way to save between acts. Now, most campaign games technically are also saved in the fact that you stop after playing one scenario or adventure, put it away, note some things down, and then when you restart, you reset everything up. Now, the thing is, with absolutely every one of these, is they let you save at a very specific point, which tends to be once you've finished your scenario or adventure, finished a, a distinct part. The problem is, I, I can't think of any games that you can literally put on pause at any point, put away, and pick up later. Now, I wish you'd be able to do this. Like, sure, you can kind of do this, like we've done this, you take a picture with your, with, uh, with your phone of the board and, you know, we put everyone's cards, like put your hand in this bag, you put your hand in this bag, you put your hand in this bag. And, you know, the resources you won't go in the bag, like there's ways you can do it. Yes, you can do it, but I haven't seen anything like this actually integrated or suggested in game rules. I mean, those rich folks with enough space could just leave a game set up and walk away to consider it saving. But well, yes, I think restoring from a save point is really the mm -hmm. key here. And arguably, this concept, depending on how implemented, could even allow you to restore to earlier save points and thus evade death, which could be handy in a co-op game. Yeah, no, what else? like, I don't even know how it would work, but it'd be really cool to be playing, say, a game of tapestry. And be like, okay, you remember when this happened and everything kind of went sideways? How about we go back and try that again? But instead of me taking this thing that kind of broke the game, I go this way. And that is just something you can't do. Yep. Now, another thing I want to talk about, and I think this is the, the biggest advantage board games currently have over tabletop games is onboarding. Now, I remember back in the day, you bought a new video game, whether it was on floppy disk or even going back to the NES days, you used to get a pretty significantly thick manual that told you how to play. It would give you uh, how to insert the cartridge and physical stuff, but it would also give you the background story. It would tell you what this game's about and who the characters are. There's usually a how to use the controller and what the game is going to include and what you should expect. There's usually reference information, like the list of items you can pick up or the enemies you'll face and things like that. Now, looking at modern video games, when's the last time you bought a game that came with a rule book? Like even digital ones are rare, only really coming with the truly epic mass of games, like when you get Civ Five. But even then, who downloads the PDF rule book or even looks at it? And this is because video games have gotten much better at onboarding, which, like I said, tabletop games still struggle with. Now, there is one somewhat exception of that, and this is something that I think uh, possibly uh, video games have taken from board games. Uh, and I can, my, my first thought is the manual I got when I bought the physical copy of Diablo 2. Mm -hmm. Now, Diablo 2 had combinations of things and, and, and things that nowadays we would just be expected to figure out in game or go on a mm -hmm. wiki and check. Uh, but they aren't given to you as a player because you're expected to take the time to find out how that thing works. Right. Uh, and that's one thing that's changed dramatically over time is the amount of effort they expect from a game player. Um, mm -hmm. Not that not that old games didn't expect effort. I think of uh, of your dad and some of the mapping he used to do. Well, yes. But uh, there's there are certain things where where discovery has become more of an aspect in video games, uh, sure. which has helped shrink down the manuals. But even that, the games that don't have that aspect tend to have the information. There's there's a log book or something, or there's a reference, or there's things you can bring up that will talk to you about how to get through it. Like, for example, I am started playing, um, drawing a blank on the name, The Witcher 2. 
but any of the Witcher games. And in the entire thing, you have this log and it's huge and it's all written by the bard from the, if you've seen the Netflix series with uh, um, Dandelion, who they call Yaskir in the series for some reason, they made up a new name because they didn't want to call him Dandelion, but you can read it all in Dandelion's words. And I've got to say, it blows me away because it updates as you're playing. So like you can look up your quest and tells you what you're supposed to do. And it's all told third person and like, and you'll ignore an NPC and then you'll go check the log and it said, and, and, um, uh, Geralt just walked by the beggar on the side of the road, totally ignoring him. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. But like all the background information on the world, which would have been in a book is all in this journal. And yes, you can read it, but none of it's required to play. Yeah. Uh, now Another, this is a tricky one because it will also, in order to do this in board games, more than likely add some material to the game. And mm -hmm. as we know, the more materials, the higher the cost. Now, that said, if implemented correctly, it may also reduce the cost of a, your rule book, which some people should probably spend more on anyway. Oh, well, <laughs> yes. So it might be worth exploring this onboarding route uh, in order to find a balance of costs where if you can shave something out of the rule book for adding a couple of cards or something or some something into uh, other portions of the game. So one of the people experimenting with this right now is Feedman Fries, uh, the designer of Power Grid. He has a number of games out called the Fast Forward Games. And in Fast Forward Games, you don't have to read a rule book and you sit down and learn the game the second you open it with your friends and it's all done through cards and you read the first card and it tells you how to set up what to pass to people what to do and then eventually says stop and you play until you hit a, a, a next point and then you do the other thing another game doing this is, would be shy pluto for space base well it kind of feels like a campaign it's actually onboarding you introducing each set of new card types to you one at a time so there are people playing with this, but like I would love to see an onboarding experience for tapestry because that is yeah. a rough one. Absolutely. It, and in many ways, it may just be you expand the uh, by expanding the rule book. You go through, look, set up the board in this way with these mm -hmm. cards out and take the deck and put these four cards out in its place. You're only going to use these four cards instead of, yeah. you know, this giant stack of cards. And you play through a round, and nobody's going to win, and nobody's going to lose. It's just going to be a game where you get to experiment and learn what moving, you know, what moving mm -hmm. up the explore track does, or what moving along the technology track does, or what passing and, and getting a new... Uh, you know, putting income, in, yeah, the in, income, phase. income phase does and all these little things that are so overwhelming to try and explain before you play yeah. your first uh, round. So I got to say, Jamie did do a good thing with that because all of the action spots aren't explained in the rule book. They're on a separate handout that you can easily pass around and nowhere does he tell you what each spot does except on there. So it's more kind of a if you don't know what the icons mean, reference. So it does have something in there. So that's kind of nice. And I will admit some older games did this where they would walk you through a round of play. But that's like the exception. Now, a perfect example of that is Twilight Imper Twilight Struggle. Sorry, not the big space game. Mm -hmm. Twilight Struggle, the, the USSR versus the US and the Cold War. That game literally at the end walks you through an entire like era. Like you play the game through different ages, walks you through an entire age, play by play, explaining why people played these cards. Now, what it's actually doing is recreating a championship game that was played of it, explaining why the strategy of the players playing use certain cards, but it gives you a full onboarding. So I got to admit, most people probably skip it, but it's awesome that it's there. Absolutely. And I, I think uh, Roger in the, sh in the uh, chat mentions Quad Heroes has a decent onboarding. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's another example of scenario based games that have a tutorial yeah. scenario. Uh, and then I think one of the ones we've talked about a number of times is Aventuria. While they don't yes. uh, specifically have an onboarding in the box, they have what they created was a something for demo teams to go out and mm -hmm. teach with. And if you get your hands on this, it is a fantastic way to introduce yes. new players to the game because it's an, an abbreviated, very, you know, set railroad style playthrough that gives you all the experience you need without overwhelming you with all the possibilities. 
Oh, totally agree. That is a good one. Uh, just correction, Yaskier, I guess, is his name in the actual books that were printed in Polish. So I'm not okay. sure where Dandelion came from, but in the video games, it's <laughs> Dandelion, um, which totally distracted me. Um, so we were even talking about this the other day, about how some of this could be done better and how it would be awesome if you could get demo kits more often, if, if that was something readily available. If publishers produce some form of demo experience, right? So, so you're going to go to Origins. And I know this has happened because I've seen people do multiple demos and they always follow the same pattern, right? So you sit down and Stronghold Games is an example. I sit down to play Porta Negra at, at the game and the board's pre-set up. Some stuff's out, some stuff's. It's not the state the game would be in if you were just starting a game. And there is a set of cards in front of me and a set of cards in front of the demo person. And those were obviously handpicked. And the person's going to walk you through the game going, look, and I use this card and you have that counter card in your hand. So you do this and they show me a 10 minute version of play. I would love to start seeing that script, that that demo experience included in the game box. Or at the very least available on the website. So yeah, a look, PDF you know, version that, or whatever. people who are teachers, people who do go out and teach it, uh, teach publicly uh, game stores you can just go to the website and download a bunch of different teaching for these new games. And if they've got a demo, they're going to have a demo get a day. They have the demo experience to provide for quick play. While you may also have other players out playing full games, mm -hmm. the new, the new players who are just interested, but not sure can go through an actual demo experience. Oh, I think that'd be fascinating overall though. I just, and again, these are some suggestions. It's not like we have all the answers. And some of the stuff we're going to mention tonight, I don't even have an answer for. I just like to see it. I would just like to see the onboarding experience for tabletop games to be better. And that goes for RPGs and board games just as well. Like RPGs, there's beginner boxes. We just re talked about beginner boxes for D&D. You don't get those from board games. Where Where's the tapestry beginner box? Would that even be a product people would buy? <laughs> Probably not. But you could conceivably get a beginner's tuck box. For tapestry, right? Or something, yeah. something, something tiny, oh. like, like just, just it doesn't need to be uh, anything significant, but just that little bit of of here's how you set it up, here's how you set up everyone's hands. Now play the game for a for a round. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next one. Unless you have something else to add. Randomization. You can put any number of things on a table for a video game. You can put a million different gem types in your game. You can't put a million different gem cards in your tabletop game. The amount of data you can store in a program that you can somehow randomize in is huge. You've got multiple story options, lines of dialogue, physical, uh, not physical, sorry, um, diverging paths. All of that you're going to be able to do way better on a computer. Yeah, no, absolutely. And this is one thing where I think fantasy games and certain styles of sci-fi games have an advantage because yeah. if you have a map based room, you've got an advantage. You can build uh, a, a set number of cards and I'm sure there are statisticians out there who can tell, who can give you more, but with a, with, with a certain number of cards, the number of possible dungeons you can create right. becomes ridiculous. Um, but then you got to use them, right? Like, so for an example, Gloomhaven has a random dungeon system, but it only uses two different rooms and it only gives you so many pre setups. And like, we did about five of them and it was already feeling a little repetitive. So, like, it's, it's, and again, I think the biggest problem here is physical limitations, cost. Like, you just, you could, like, every card is going to give you more powers, but you can't throw in a thousand of them. Oh, I guess uh, Ryan's pointing out in the back, the new Stellaris board game, which is being crowdfunded, has 3000 cards in the box. So that is one way to do it. Uh, well, and Stellaris is is uh, a whole different. I mean, the Stars is 4X Twilight Imperium uh, yeah. competition. But no, I mean, really, what I'm thinking is and I, and I think Gloomhaven, Gloomhaven does things very right in some ways, but I don't think their concept of a random dungeon does necessarily. No. Um, whereas, you know, if you just build square cards, uh, that have either one entrance or two entrances or three entrances or four oh, geomorphs, entrances, right? yeah, I mean, I'm looking, I'm thinking specifically of the, the cards they use in 
the uh, video game that we both reviewed. Guild of Dungeoneering. Guild of Dungeoneering, where it's just basic, dun- uh, you know, basic dungeon mm-hmm. shapes or basic, basic cave shapes. And, and you know, with a, a couple of different entrances and ed- exits and a couple of different tunnels and the ability to rotate 90 degrees, you know, you've got thousands of dungeon comps, mm-hmm. whereas you had to fit things together very specifically in Gloomhaven. Mm, yes. You couldn't pick any two cards and put them together. Uh, as you found out, because I think you even had yes. some, there was well, some no, mistakes. There was a misprint. Right. There was a misprint on one of them. So, like other things with randomization, of course, too, is 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 massive numbers and the math involved. Uh, it just I, the thing that can fix this, and this is what publishers are doing, is using apps, right? You look at Mansions of Madness First Edition with its fiddly cards you put over the board, and I don't know how many times we're going to say you can replay a certain scenario five times and always discover something new. With the app, you could play that same scenario a hundred times and always find something new. And they can always add to it, which is something we'll kind of get into when I talk about a different topic later. But the fact that you you can integrate the apps will give you that variability. And I've got to say, that's what a lot of the Gloomhaven competitors seem to be leaning towards, is these app-based stories and app-based campaigns, because they can put all that in without having to put in thousands of different cards to read. Right. Uh, I think an example of of what I'm thinking of, actually, that I just remembered about is the new Clank, Clank Catacombs, where you actually are building the dungeon rather than Mm -hmm. having a set board as we're used to in the uh, world of Clank. Here, interestingly enough, we're at CG Realm the other day and I found a Scythe product I didn't know existed. There is a variable board for Scythe. So you can buy this board for side that has various hex tiles that get shuffled and randomly placed on the board. So that is an example of a game doing it. And to be honest, Catan. Catan is an extremely popular game that has one of the most variable boards out there. Like not every game has, most Euro games are like, boom, Catan? No, no, no. Just shuffle them up and put them down. Just make sure you actually put the numbered tiles uh, yeah, in the Yeah, that's right the problem. Spot. Some people, some people some randomize people it more than that. you're actually allowed to. Yes. <laughs> don't, don't, don't house rule Catan. Put the num- number of chits going A, B, C, D, E, F, G, spiraling. Do it properly. Do not, do not <laughs> just put them out randomly. It will ruin the game. Uh, the other option is, and the, the people need to, to sort of think about or, or, or possibilities to include are combinations, right? So no, you can't have a million different gems in your game, but if you have 25 different gems in your game and the ability to mix and match between gems, so Mm -hmm. one gem does one thing, two gems do a different thing, the two other gems do another different thing, then when you get into those uh, combinations, the the combinatoric mathematics become... (laughs) uh ridiculous and so you can get vast numbers by using those combinations you know what that is a really good point because look at quacks of quedlinburg board games are doing this by using the same component for different things so the same component but all you got to do is switch out that recipe book and now it does something completely different which then leads me to another point look at the 8-bit box Here's a bunch of generic game components, and here's another set of rules, and each component is used for something different. And an extreme example would be Friedman Fries again, his 504, the the board game flip book where you pick a mechanic uh, and condition, and I don't even remember what the three things are, and combine those to play one of 504 unique games all with the same components. Right. So there's definitely some people out there doing some of this in interesting ways. And I got to say, I think that's possibly the best possible way is like a, a Imhotep did the exact same thing, right? We're just going to throw in some new boards, but by mixing and matching them with the old ones, you're still using the same components. You're still using the same basic rules. We've now went to like Imhotep with the expansion. There's 10, 28 different ways, possible board company. Who's going to play Imhotep over a thousand times? So it's definitely there are people doing some good work with this and trying to mix things up with randomness. Yeah, even if your game is basic, understanding statistics and combinatorics can be a vital aspect of making your game just that much fuller of an experience and able to stay on the table that much longer Mm -hmm. in a a one and done world. 
And I think a good one for publishers to think of is, do you need a million different gem types? Like in a video game, it's kind of like, why not? Plus, video games get played by millions of people, right? The mass market is way bigger. So you will want people to have different appearance. But if you can get your game up to 500 possible game states, heck, if you can get to 100 possible game states, you're probably good. There aren't going to be a lot of people out there. There are games I own that I've played over 100 times. So I, that's, but like you get it to up to those number of game states, you probably don't need more randomization than that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it doesn't, getting up to 128 doesn't take too many combinations. Like you can do that with yeah. very few cards. All right. My next one is something that video games can do. I'll just, yeah, sure. No problem. Is making changes to game components. Now, what this, the, the main thing that drove my thought on this one are the roguelikes, right? All of these games, like Rogue Book, which we reviewed, check out our review, solid game. Um, Splay the Spire and all of those, where it's a deck builder and you have your cards, but you can improve them. You can level up each of those cards, but not only that, you can level up multiple times and most importantly, in different ways. You can slot different things on them. How do you do that physically? Like, and, and keep track of your deck. Like, Ascension tried it. It had a way where you could upgrade your cards, but you had to swap them for another card. So you basically had a big pile of cards sitting beside your board. And when you took the right action in the game, you had to look through it to find your card and swap. But that only, like, that's one iteration. That's one change from this card to that card. Now, Mystic Veil has taken some steps to recreate this. This is a game where you build your cards as playing. So you start off with basic cards that have one ability on them. And then you're going to use those to buy new card parts. And each card can have up to three parts and you literally slot them into a sleeve so you make a new card, which is fantastic. But that is the only game that I think does anything like this. Yeah, and, and people people might might say, oh, well, why not use right on wipe off or use, uh, use dry erase? Well, unfortunately, if it's a card, odds are you're going to be shuffling or stacking mm. and friction and uh, dry erase don't go together well. True. Um, one option is, of course, sleeving. Uh, so you can have rather than a stack of other cards, you can have a stack of sleeves that modify and you can have yep. set, you know, uh, these are all my plus one, uh, you know, stat one sleeves. And these are all my plus one stat two sleeves. And you could you could do things that way. But that's, See, that's still a little different. Mystic fiddling. Veil has you sleeve multiple cards into one sleeve. That's right. how they get away with it. Well, I mean, it's interesting. If, I don't think I've seen anyone do sleeves that have the data on them. The other option would be um, sleeves with a gloom style card, right? Yeah, See through. That's, that's what that's, Mystic, that's Mystic is. Gray. Yeah. Uh, Those are the two options that I think of because uh, you couldn't. The problem is you couldn't really do sleeve and sleeve well. Yeah, right. Because um, then so if you, you need, have a plus one and a plus two, you'd, you'd have to you'd have to have a different sleeve that would did plus one and plus two. So. That, interesting it gets it gets tricky um but yeah either the other you know mul either multiple cards in sleeves or different sleeves on, on top of cards are both valid options that you could uh certainly look at so there you go that's that maybe that's the new level up for the next level so whoever designed mystic veil are you listening that's your next step so that'll give you a fourth way to modify your cards as sleeves with stuff on <laughs> now moving away from cards games that have done this with dice so the first one I can think of is Rattlebones. Um, CGE? No, Rio Grande Games. Rio Grande Games has a patented plastic dice with pop-off cards. The most recent game to release under is Dice Realms, and man, does it look good. Though I don't want to sort all the stupid pieces when I start playing, which is another topic we'll get to in a minute. Um, that lets you actually modify your dice in the game, and I think that's fantastic. Now, what we need is the, the middle between the cards and that, like a way to modify your meeples or your, a way to modify another randomizer or your resources. Like I just, like, like Mystic Veil scratches the surface on being able to do this. Rattle Bones, the, the roll, one of the um, roll for the Galaxy expansions also use those dice. Um, then there's, is it Dice Throne? Or di I'm, what's the one with the cardboard chips on the dice? Oh, uh, Dice Throne's not the name. Dice something. Yeah, I know. I know what the one you mean, and I can't think of it. It's, I play it on Board Game Arena. It's actually really solid. Where, again, you're upgrading your dice. So, so there are some games doing it, but like compared to, you know, I slot my boulder on top of this card, so now it does this. Or I guess an example with the Meeples, Dice Forge. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, an example with the Meeples would be the, the tiny Epic Games have started to have things, but all they really are is, is they're using the tried and true mechanic that you have a card in front of you and there's a reminder on the table. 
See, where the, where you're slotting a sword into your meeple so everyone remembers you have a sword. Right. But it's not really modifying the meeple. Uh, I mean, you can modify your meeples. You, you can put, you know, you can do the, the not, I, you don't have to go as far as Lego, but you can go with, you know, the, a, hole in, a hole in each arm where you can slot a sword into the arm. Yeah, that's, and, what it, that's exactly what yeah. the Tiny Epic games do. Yeah. Tiny Epic Zombies, Tiny Epic, Epic Realms. But again, that, that, again, it's just a physical representation of a card. It's, it's, it's a way to tell you that, hey, look, this meeple has something special. Well, I, but I mean, that's okay if you take it to the next level, because what I think is important is doing something. And here we're going to, I'm going to talk about Hellbringer, uh, which they did right on wipe off on your, on your, your mm -hmm. character really well. You know, you, you, you make use of right on, of, of right on wipe off in places where you don't have to worry about the friction, right? right. Cards are not the right place, but the board might be player mm -hmm. boards. Uh, there are a lot of places on a game where right on wipe off uh, dry True. erase may be the right solution. And it's something that probably because of costs, uh, people haven't really experimented too much with, but I yeah. think it's worth looking at uh, in some cases. So here's an example of a game that tried. Sean got to try this. Yep. It was, uh, I don't know if I'd call it a success, but you had a character standee that had like all these slots on it and you would attach all these little chips and tokens to it to actually improve your game piece to show what armor you had, what item you were holding, what your hit points were, how many magic points you had, and whether you were elite or not. And I've got to say the concept isn't bad. The ability to look on the board and see everything that character had is a great idea. Now, it wasn't implemented that well because the things were almost unreadable and they were too tiny and you didn't know what the mouth they meant. Um, so you kind of had to pick up the piece anyway. But there was a game that tried. Absolutely. Now, I think I think the, the big problem that they had is they went with the old slot in slot solution. Yes. And while I understand why they did that, and I'm sure there were cost implications to doing it that way and it kept components cheap, it wasn't, it turned out to be the best solution. A better solution would be the plastic clips. And so you, you still oh, have to have standees. I've seen those. People hate those. I know. There's a reason people hate Betrayal but people House hate, on the Hill. But people hate standees. So the moment you, like, and you have to have a standee to do this, essentially, to do it like, thoroughly enough. Because, yes, you can slot a couple of things in a meeple, but you run out of space pretty quick. Whereas if you have a standee, you can clip things on. And there are ways other than plastic clips. I mean, you could go with uh, um, these things. Similar, like this sort of, you know, some right. of the smaller, the small versions of these. Uh, these things come really, really small. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's, even that's like a big one. Like you can get them really tiny. Uh, and that is a fantastic solution to, you know, clipping things onto a standee. The problem is people hate standees. Uh, so... Uh, you know, maybe you go with the clear plastic standees. Maybe people like those better than the cardboard ones. I don't know. Yeah. But but standees are no, kind see, of right now the solution. Here's the actual level up. Instead of a meeple, you just get an action figure and you get all <laughs> the gear and stuff. Like you play, you put an actual G.I. Joe out there and put the backpack on and put the helmet on. And now we're getting into Warhammer territory because that's literally <laughs> the rules of right. Games Workshop games. WYSIWYG. Your model has to be equipped as it is in the game, which is right. a rule I hated and one of the reasons <laughs> I stopped playing because um, I just want my models to look cool and they yep. can represent whatever they want. So there's a like, so that is actually being done in the miniature game world. Fair. I am, and people have advanced that technology to be using rare earth magnets so they can swap stuff out. So actually there's a space where the the war game industry the miniature war game industry is actually doing better than the tabletop game industry. although you're getting to a lot of cost there if you if you want well, to start yeah, putting 30 some dollars yeah. a figure nowadays right absolutely uh one another option that just sort of came to mind when i said you know the plastic standees uh use um i don't want to say shrinky dinks but the little plastic uh rubber you know plasticky yeah. sticky things you can oh color forms like color form color form onto, onto a plastic standee might be a solution. I don't there necessarily know if it's a good solution. You I'm not recommending it, but it's stuff. something that might be worth experimenting with on a... Actually, uh, I, I'm kind of... I, I wish I almost wish this was a brunch. Um, when you get a chance, Google Chimera Station. So here is a worker placement game where you can actually modify your workers. And it's little plastic pieces where you give your alien new abilities like tentacles 
and crab claws and bigger brains so they can do more stuff. So that is a great example of a game that's pushing these limits. You literally upgrade your physical component, your your meeple, and it matters in game what you've done. So there's stackable meeples and there's different heads and different bodies and different legs and such. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only problem with that game is they snap together too good and I, I someone's got to be bleeding out there from it. Like I right. pinched myself twice during a, a demo game. Right. Plus, I do worry that after years, they may not, which who knows if you play the game for years, but they may not stick together so well. But based on how much they click together, <laughs> they clearly uh, planned for the long term. Yes. Yes. They are not easy. All right. So making changes to game components like permanent find a way so that I can it's basically tracking stuff on things that are going to get reused without having to replace them, I guess, is is kind of what this kind of boils down to. Right. All right. The next one I want to talk about is immersion, where you feel like you're in the game. You just don't tend to get that in tabletop games. Right. Wait, we're both now playing Hades. I got why well, I got Sean Hook, but <laughs> multiple people have told him to play it. Like in that game, I feel like I'm Zagreus. I'm making decisions for as Zagreus and I, I care about what happens to Zagreus. And yes, in role playing games, it happens. You can definitely feel like your character get immersed in your character. Some people taking it too far, even um, you can definitely get into it. But like you don't tend to get that at all in board games, like even when you're playing um, like a dungeon crawl games where you play a single character, I don't usually ever feel like I'm that character. Like, I, I don't know what can be done to fix it. And then there's the whole video game flow state. Like, even if you're not playing an individual character, you're flying a spaceship or something else, or you get to this point where you forget you're playing a game, right? You don't remember that to jump on the Koopa, I have to hit the A button to jump. You just jump on the Koopa. Like it just happens. And then like I say, I've heard this called the flow state. And it like, is there a way to recreate this in a board game? Like, I don't think I've ever hit a flow state while playing a board game. I, I think, and this is, this is something I think you and I are probably just going to agree to disagree on. Uh, I'm kind of not interested in this. Um, okay. I, I, it, this one for me doesn't work. I don't want the soundtrack there. I don't want, to be pushed into the game. If the game, if sitting and playing the game as it is as it exists now, as as they exist today, isn't enough to get me into the game, um, I'm not really interested in in tricks and hacks and other things to to bring me into it any further. I want the theme and the mechanics to be able to do that or not. And it may not be a bad thing if they don't. Uh, I don't want to get into the, you know, Monopoly <laughs> mood if I'm yeah. playing. Uh, I do, you know, I don't want to uh, become a uh, complete jerk if I'm playing a take that game. Um, you know, it's again, but if I if I want to feel like a uh, like Indiana Jones when I'm playing uh, Arnak, maybe the game should be enough to do that because the th- theme and the actions you're taking right. and the way you're thinking about what you have to do next in the game pushes you into that spot without a soundtrack or something else. Yeah. See, soundtracks are one way I could think of to get you more into the game. Evocative stories is another way to do it. Now I was thinking about this and I can think of one game that actually does this, which would be uh nictophobia where you are literally blindfolded and using your sense of touch to play the game. And you will have like literal jump scares and when someone says, you know, you found a rock and you just touch something physical and you're like, that's a rock. You definitely get that feel that I just found a rock. Now, you're not doing the physical action of picking up a, a, a rock, but that definitely happens. And then the other thing I was thinking about is these modern escape games yeah. definitely give you a bit of a feel of this when you're manipulating physical things. And the Chronicles of Crime series. Now, there's only one small part of that game. I got to admit, when I'm scanning a QR code, I don't feel like I went and talked to someone. But there is a an aspect of that game where you put on a VR headset or you hold up your phone in AR mode. And sorry, it's not AR. But you hold up your phone and you look around a crime scene. Right. Now, it's cartoony. Like, actually, I haven't played. I've, the only ones I've played, it's cartoony. Maybe in the um, modern crime ones, they're they're more photorealistic. But you're looking around a crime scene and literally moving your, you know, moving your phone and looking around and trying to find things. So I think that does give you some of that immersion that, that would be lacking. 
And I agree. I don't want to feel like a, a landlord in Monopoly, but <laughs> if I, I don't know if I'm playing a Jedi in Star Wars Imperial Assault, it'd be kind of cool to feel like I could use the force in some way. I don't know exactly what that would be. Right. I guess, yeah, I guess it's sort of just sort of what you're looking for differently. Um, what's an, another one I was thinking of, uh, and it's completely escaped my mind now. Uh, hmm. Like there are some games like Hellbringer that have, you know, where you read off the story before you go in and do it. Uh, you know, we've had a few games like that where you, where you've, you know, they try to set the scene of the, right. the card battle you're going to go into. But there's a real disconnect between yeah. this emotional battle uh, battle scene and then playing out your decks of cards. <laughs> you know, yes. again, <laughs> yes. um, there, in some ways, it would actually be better to not to, to either not have that up front or have it at the end, like after you finished this card, and then you can sort of uh, retroactively think yeah. about what you've done and and place it into that world. I don't know. There is definitely a line between the story and theme and throwing it in the game and how to tie it together and that. But I, I don't know if that's a real how to make theme come out more in board games, I think might be a completely different topic. <laughs> Fair. Now, I did think of one other type of game where I think this does happen. Um, it's a type of game I don't like, though, is social deduction games. Like, yes, when you play werewolf, you don't feel like a werewolf. But if you're the werewolf, you definitely feel like the odd person out and you are definitely trying to hide who you are and try to get away with as much as you can. Well, I think that, that is that definitely King Arthur game that you do love. Yes, that's <laughs> Shadows over Camelot. Shadows over Camelot. Like Camelot. You, you get into character, right? If you're a heroic knight, you feel the tension of the, the castles and we're going to lose. And if we don't defeat the Black Knight. So it's there. There, there is some immersion in some board games. I, I just I would like to see more of it. And Sean sounds like you would like to see less of it, depending, like only in the right game. And and then there's the 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 wrong way to do it, which is we've talked about multiple times, Battlestar Galactica. But we don't need to retell that story here. Yeah. So it, <laughs> it, sometimes it can go wrong. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That that's more about role playing in games and when you should and shouldn't. Yeah. Actually, I saw Solon today was complaining that people were playing a dungeon crawling board game in his store and spending way too much time role playing. <laughs> and uh, and he's like, why are these people spending all this time role playing in a dungeon crawling board game? And I just replied because with that's because they're awesome. Because <laughs> to me, that's what makes those games so much more fun. Fair enough. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next one, which is in general, I, I not counting downloading patches or anything like that. Uh, in general, video games have no setup and takedown time. And to me, this is the thing that draws people to play video games versus tabletop a lot of the time. You just sit down and start playing. Honestly, I have sat here and went, I could go try Rust Ruins Arnak solo downstairs before I review tonight, or I could just boot up a computer game and just start playing right now, or I could go do another run in Hades. Now, this is one there's not a lot tabletop games can do, right? They're physical games that require physical presence and set up and tear down. There are things that help. Um, box inserts. Our, we had an entire discussion way back in our first year of the show about our box inserts worth it, and our end result was if it helps get the game to the table more often, then it's worth it. Yeah, and this this really depends on the insert. Some inserts and some sets make a huge difference and really make things vastly easier to set up. You hand out a, a few boxes to people, you put mm -hmm. out the, the board and a couple of boxes on the board, and you're ready to play. Uh, yeah. versus what happens with most games is you have to sort components this, out sort of this it. and dump this and sort this out here. And you've got a bag of stuff you need to sort through and, and, and so shuffle these and do this and do that. Shuffling is one huge thing. And, and actually this actually goes back a little bit to the randomization problem. If you get a fresh deck in a video game, it's randomized, assuming that the programmer mm -hmm. isn't an idiot. If you shuffle, <laughs> if you shuffle a deck of cards, odds are really good. Unless you know what you're doing, it's not random. Yeah. Yeah, they say seven riffle shuffles, but again, you have to riffle shuffle properly. So yep. <laughs> that's a whole thing. Yeah. How components are organized, though, something can happen. Now, one of the things I do like, and this is where publishers can help with this, is start including these box inserts in your games. Don't just pack your game so that the components get to the customer in good shape. Yes, I realize that is the main goal with most existing box inserts. They're not organizers, they're inserts to make sure nothing gets damaged. 
but take that next step. Go and provide some type of organization. Um, we just opened up side. I don't know why there's only two, but it comes with these two nice little plastic containers for holding your resources. The four types of resources. I don't know why I only get two containers, but you use the bottoms and the tops, and I guess it works. It's a little confusing. It's a, but but that's a little thing they can do. Um, miniatures coming in plastic trays that they can go back into, which not only protect the miniatures, but also make it easier. But again, Scythe comes with one of these. I would have loved it if that was four separate or five separate ones. So, so I could be like, here's yours, here's yours, here's yours, here's yours, right? It's a little thing. There are other things you can do too, like make every resource a different shape in brightly defined colors to make them easier to sort. You still got to sort them, but it's just quicker to grab all the red, brown, whatever. Plus you're going to help the game make your game more accessible, which is a big thing as well. Uh, make your cards clearly different decks. Like, I hate this. When you get a game where the only difference on the back of the cards is a small Roman numeral one, two, three, and it tells you to sort the decks into one, two, three and shuffle them and then restack them. Make them bright colors. Make one orange, the next one brown, and the other one chartreuse. And then I, I can easily tell them where to, where, how to sort them, right? That's another thing you can do. Another thing is what do you do with stuff when done with it? Far too many games are just like removed from the game. Well, if it said like remove from the game and put into this box, that way it's there. Next time you go to set up, it's already in the box you need it in or even having a spot to discard cards. Yeah. Because many games just say discard, but there's no spot on the board to discard them. So then you end up with one discard pile. Sometimes you end up with four. I played games of Terraforming Mars where it seemed like every player had their own discard in front of them or every pair of players. And then at the end of the game, you got to gather them all together. And then if you have multiple decks, again, uh, say you've got technology cards and you got resource cards and you've got spending cards and they all end up in your same hand. Well, people, when they tend to discard, just throw them in the same pile. I have a spot with three different discards. So at the end of the game, I don't have to sort through all the cards. Yeah, no, it, it's there's so many little things that can be done. And the problem, of course, we run into is cost. Uh, every piece of material that goes into a box ups the cost. And we're already at a point where cost is a problem in the hobby game industry. Um, and I mean, it, to be fair, it is also in the video game industry. Steam is a perfect example where there are a lot of people out there who don't buy full price games anymore uh, yeah. because they know that the Steam summer sale is going to come around mm -hmm. or whatever is going to happen and there will be a discount. Uh, and reviews are getting to the point on Steam. You will see a lot of times where it's like, I think this game is worth it at a 40% discount. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, that Definitely that sort thing. of things happen, and we are moving that way in the board game world as well, uh, yep. because frankly, it's a elite hobby. Uh, it is an expensive hobby, even as it is right now. Before you start looking at all these other yeah. options, but I will admit, as someone who buys these games, I would be willing to pay more for a game. I will get to the table more often because it's easier to set up and take down. Like, I don't want to have to go to a third party. I don't want to have to go to Etsy. I don't want to have to go to Meeple Realty. I don't want to have to go to Folded Space and buy a third party insert. I want to be able to, like, maybe just companies need to contact these other companies and sell them in bundles. And if you want it, you get it. And yeah. give me, like, you know, if you buy it bundled together, you get a discount. Like, there's got to be a better way to get that functionality in the box when I get it without having to make me go shop and look for something third party. Like, I, lots of other companies have learned this. Yep. Now, another one, we've talked about this many, many times that is an important part about this. Give me a separate sheet that shows me how to set up everything. Give me reference cards. Give me how to plays. Give me walkthroughs. Give me all that too, so I can teach the game better, so we can quickly set it up. Give me a nice thing that's like a big size of the box picture of the game setup, so I can put it on the table while I'm passing everything out for people to shuffle. They can look to see where it goes. Those aren't huge costs. In many cases, they may even be free because they can be included in your card count. Why? Why is it that I need to go to the esoteric order of gamers exactly. every time in order to get these? Why, you know, we've, we've gotten to the point now where some of our great content creators that we know and love on Twitch, uh, like Paul, are getting called up 
to create content for board games, write man, you know, ra writing manuals or writing online mm -hmm. tutorials for things. Why aren't companies going to the esoteric order of gamers and saying, can you make us a, uh, you know, a help a guide to help play this game or something? Because mm -hmm. why are, again, why are we re relying on third parties to do a first party job? No offense, Paul and Rodney, you know, we're not trying to put you out of business. That's that's not our goal. Oh, here. no, I, I, we still want them. That's great. Yes. But we also want this instant setup. You know, we want the yes. quick setup. We want the we want the reference because you still need to learn the game. We still need mm -hmm. the Rodneys and the Pauls. Uh, but we also want something in the box that will help us even yes. after we've learned the game. Uh, no, you, know, I, I, you don't have to you don't have to learn Arnak again. Uh, our Arnak's a bad example. There's a lot of games where you don't have to learn the game, but you still need to crack the manual to set it up every mm -hmm. single time. Like, how many of those games are there where, yeah, no, oh, I know yeah. how to play this game. I can set up, I can, but every I gotta deck get builder. it on the, on what's the, the hand size? Yeah. Every deck builder. What's my hand size? Do I shuffle when I'm out of cards or when I go to draw? Those two questions should be a card <laughs> in every deck builder that answers those questions. Right. On, on a board, like, you know, every time. Every there time are cards board, when they're something. played. Do they go to a play area or a discard? Yeah. Are they immediately discarded or at the end of my turn? Like, there's just certain things that I always have to look up because every game handles them a little bit differently. Yeah. Uh, and that's and this is even the easy games. It this it, this is, should be a no brainer when you get to more complex games yeah. like um, Anachrony. I mean, my God, the different number of setups available in that game, yet there's a different book for every setup. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna move to the next one because this is going longer than I thought it would. MMO multiplayer online. This one's funny. The, the this probably wouldn't even been on my list because I would have never even considered it as a possibility. But with COVID and many people around the world being locked home and not able to get together with their game group, this has gotten better. There are many publishers now who have released rules variants for playing their games over Zoom or some other chat program. There are Zoomable game lists out there now. Now, it's so far, I've yet to open a game and it have right in the box telling me how to play it online right away. But it's definitely becoming a go on their website, check the PDF, get the how to play it online ability. So I am now seeing companies offering multiplayer online games where Sean and I could get together and physically play side together. Now, I don't know if size is one that's zoomable, <laughs> to be honest, off the top of my head. Uh, now, I mean, there are other solutions. There are third party, again, third party solutions like Vorpal Board, uh, which I've never used and I have questions about but it's out there and it has it does have some support um uh so I there are of course uh like a board game arena right tabletop simulator table tokyo that's not what i mean i i want to sit down and have the physical components to be able to play right so we set up gloomhaven somehow and sean can play with with gloomhaven set up here me tori cat and d and sean well you can't play gloomhaven five player whatever bad example <laughs> and sean is up there on a laptop and is able to take part and play. Like, I'm, I'm not talking about, again, once you get into digital games, you're getting into stuff that video games already are good at, like tracking points and doing math for you and handling shuffling of decks and that, right? By that point, I'm like, you're, you're now doing that overlap. That Venn diagram is now overlapped and we're getting into that blurry spot where is it a board game, is it a video game? I'm talking about being able to play a physical board game with someone not in the same physical space. Yeah. No, and that's, again, you know, Vorpal Board is designed for that. I'm sure there are other solutions out there. I just have had that one yeah. thrown at me a, a number of times. Uh, but, again, all it really is is a, a way, somewhere to put your cards and, a, and camera. It's, it's basically a fancy sort of, um, you know, Zoom, <laughs> Zoom right. client uh, designed for board games. Uh you know, Roger says it would be cool if you could buy part of a larger game you could play online. Uh, like, and, and that's and that would actually be really interesting is if you could buy, uh, you know, parts of Gloomhaven. So you didn't have to buy all of Gloomhaven. You bought you, you know, buy these... the deck for your character. Exactly. I could buy my part of Gloomhaven that I needed as a remote player uh, and we could play that. That would definitely be a viable solution for some games. Um that's or, an interesting way. Yeah, like any of those 
deck builders, right? Yep. Like if God, hmm. even deck builders, like uh, they, they again, if you share. have variant rules, if you had your own copy of Ascension, I have mine. Yes, there's a chance we'll both get the same card, which normally wouldn't happen. Right. But the ability to play would probably outdo that. Yeah. Outweigh that. So now what Roger's question first made me think, and I read it wrong because I didn't see buy, was what I have seen now is games where you play, you then go online and put in the results, and that affects something, whether it's a virtual game world, just an online scoreboard, or something of that aspect. Um, I'm going to spoil something here. Charterstone has this. There is an aspect of Charterstone where you are going to get a world map and see where your board is in the world. And you can compare it to other people's boards and see a growing kingdom of everyone who's ever played Charterstone. And I'm like, that is fantastic. That is just really neat. And it's one of the main reasons I want to play again <laughs> so that we can rank better <laughs> for our kingdom. Right. Uh, another example of that would be D and D organized play. Um, I don't know if they do much with adventure. Uh, what's it called now? Adventure League now, but it used to be that in Living Forgotten Realms, you logged every game and depending and and would put in like the results, and they would change the game world. Now, what they would do is take the average. Like you know, if the average group didn't defeat this red dragon, well, suddenly that red dragon goes on a rampage. Right. And I thought that was really cool, and I would like to see more of that. But that re requires a company like Hasbro, right? Like that requires, you know, Stonemeyer Games to, well, Stonemeyer's a bad example too. Whatever, a mom and pop game shop to somehow have a web developer that can write an MMO to go with all their games. But I think it'd be really cool to see more, um, what'd you call it? Shared experience, right? Where yeah. Where you play the game over there, I play it here, and somehow my game could affect yours. Yeah, no, that'd be interesting. And I, I just did a quick look, and it doesn't look like Adventure League is quite the same as it used to be. They're, yeah, they're... I don't, I don't know. Like, I think they have big events, right? Like at D and D Expo, there might be like a tournament game where the the outcome of that tournament game might affect the storyline. Right. Uh, just like Games Workshop did, right? When they destroyed the Warhammer World, Games right. Workshop did this, where they had you fight the end times battle. The the actual war versus chaos happened, and they promised everyone that if chaos won. We're going to scrap the game and chaos won and they eliminated the game. You cannot play Warhammer fantasy battle that Sean and I grew up playing. The game is dead. Um, there were rumors it was coming back. I don't know if that ever happened, but for a number of years, you're stuck with age of Sigmar and it's your own fault for not defeating <laughs> chaos. People come on. There we go. Now, Ryan makes a point to go back to, to, to what we were talking about too, is who really would rather play with physical components with distance when there's virtual tabletops? I would. Yeah, I generally I, speaking, I would much yeah. rather if I if I could set up, you know, Star Realms in front of me right now and play Sean online, I'd rather do that than play Board Game Arena. There are absolutely 100% benefits to physical play uh that just there's a there's a tactile aspect to board games that you do not get on BGA. There are some Board Game Arena games where yeah, it's fine, you know. Sure, you're yeah. just rolling two dice and and moving a, moving something around, it doesn't matter. But there's definitely a tactile aspect to cards and the way you're holding cards and seeing cards that makes a big difference mm -hmm. in, in a lot of games. Um, and the game we're going to be reviewing tonight is actually yeah, one of example. them where it, mm -hmm. it, uh, it makes a big difference whether you're playing online or not, or whether you have played in person or not. Yeah. Another example with role-playing games, I tried running a game online. I have no interest in doing that again. Like I may do it just because some people have asked me to do it, but like I I want to play in person. Where well, like even if we even if I ran one, I would probably do what we did last and not have a virtual tabletop again, unless like Sean runs it in the background and I don't have to worry about it. I'm like I have enough to worry about. I don't want to worry about all this technology in the background. <laughs> Give me my DM screen and my dice and my adventure. All right, last one because we've been talking about this for a while. Iteration. Okay, so this is something. The, the reason video games stay so popular, especially the stupid um, micro app, micro transaction apps, is small progressive changes to the game based on what you've done. Now, legacy games do some of this, right? But legacy games generally require the same group of players and a large time commitment and tend to have a long campaign. What I'm talking more about here is something in, say, Azul, 
which, you know, once you've scored 80 points in Azul, you now unlock a new tile color. Like, think about how much harder Azul would get if there was now another color in there, right? Something like that, right? Just a little... Video games do this a lot, right? They, they give you little tiny additions. You need to move your mouse. Thank you. <laughs> your mouse cursor is putting words on... Is it mine? No, it's because it's not mine. I don't know. Anyway, I'll, I, I can't read because it says in big letters, Anonymous Platypus. Oh, weird. So I'm like, I can't read what <laughs> it's saying. All right, sorry. <laughs> um, so video games add in a lot of this to keep you playing, right? As well as a reward. And to, 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 to reiterate, like it just gets a little bit harder, whatever. There's a little bit more monsters next time. There's You get an additional card in your deck, whatever. Just small incremental changes to keep the game interesting. I would love to see some of that on the tabletop. That's not, like I said, a big, like, I don't know, a legacy game you can play a hundred times maybe where like every time you just add a new card. Like every time you play Clank, you throw one new card in the deck. Your deck eventually is just this new thing that's going to be there going forward. Now, Draconis did that. Uh, that's one of the best examples I can think of is the Wrath expansion for Draconis that just slowly added new things in over 13 games that wasn't, you know, the next game at Charterstone. Like right. it, it was, it was small increments. I would like to see more of that. Yeah, and it's hard to do. Like, I mean, you look at something like uh, DC Deck Builder, where yeah, you can add in a new expansion, but that's a, a you know a reasonably big change. Yeah, it's a and big chunk. To do, you know, you need to you need to sort of reshuffle things, and there it's actually big enough that they expect you to take out a chunk of the base cards in order to mm -hmm. make sure you, uh, you know, it, it balances out. Um, it's hard to say how to do that i mean maybe it could be as simple as you know again if it if it's a card based game uh the publisher starts putting out booster packs you can pick up every once in a while as stuff you can add in uh at yeah, certain points honestly, maybe or, maybe that's the living card game format really yeah. is is we're gonna put out a new pack of cards every month and you get to add those into your game so i, th I think it's being done at just for me it's always a bit it always feels like like you're changing the game whereas i don't i want the same game with just i don't know a right. little bit more. Well, you want, I mean, essentially what you're talking about is small expansion packs, uh, promo cards, um, you know, hey, in this, you know, a promo card like, where you only add the it... game where it's like, don't open, the, like, like, make every game a legacy game, I guess, right? I guess, like, yeah. like, don't include these cards until you've unlocked, put achievements in there. I didn't even think of achievements. Achievements is a whole thing. But that's, I mean, that's kind of a different. Topic. I would like to even see like with Azul, this could be it's it's something where, you know, it's not there at the start. It o you only add the extra color yeah. if someone Once... that game gets 80 points and then the next game it's gone again. Um, yeah, but then you got to play multiple games to throw the color in like you'd, you'd have to be set up. I would just someone unlocked it. So in a way, unlockables and achievements is maybe more what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. So playing Scythe, which I'll be talking about later tonight, one of the things it included, which it didn't mention in the rule book, is there was a sheet of achievements. And the first player to achieve each of these things is supposed to write their name down on the day to happen. And I'm like, that's just cool. Having that in there kind of gives you something to do. And, and on it was an achievement that I was like, that's a thing. You can do that. And then the next time I played, I had to figure out how to do that. Right. And I discovered a new aspect of the game from it. Um, Viticulture did this. The, the original Viticulture in Tuscany, and I have no idea if the essentials do this. So the original Viticulture was a full game. You played it, it was a solid game. Well, Tuscany had 13 or so different little modules. And what it was, was the next player to win a game of Viticulture picks one of those modules. It's now in the game from now on. Then whoever wins that game picks another module and then throws it in. And then every game going on has that module and so on. And eventually you would unlock all of Tuscany. And honestly, I never unlocked all of Tuscany. But I thought that was really cool, was just this, this slow progress. And again, it goes with the onboarding, right? It's a slow addition of more stuff to the game. Well, I, I actually like that idea from Scythe uh, of, of achievements, where you're not necessarily adding anything into the game. No. But by aiming for achievements, there are new things about the game you can learn. It's yes. like, oh... How do I get the, you know, flaming ball of wax achievement? Oh, well, there's this thing over here that I've never really explored. Mm -hmm. I bet you if I go up there, I can get it. And that just makes the game different because you're yeah. forced into trying different things. And like, it's not going to work the... in Azul, but in a bigger game like Scythe. Even Azul. 
win a game without having five of a single color. There's an achievement for Azul. Like you can, and now we might, there, here's our new thing we can start working <laughs> on. I can start making board game achievements for various okay. different board games. Hey, D, you listening? This might be a thing. <laughs> that, that could be like a free newsletter packs. downloadable thing. Yep. No, seriously, I, I, we could do some cool stuff. With no, like for example, the one I saw was win a game without building any mechs. And I was like, how the heck do you win a game aside without building mechs? Is <laughs> that even possible? But well, must be, because here it is on this achievement sheet. So I went, that's it. I'm going to see. And I didn't. I built Max. Like I, I'm like, I don't know the game well enough to try to win without building Max. <laughs> I have no idea. Plus, plus we decided at this point, we're like, I'm not filling in the achievement sheet. But the next time we sit down to play seriously without any alcohol involved with the full group, we're going to be like, hey, this is a thing. And I think we should start filling it out because I think it'll be cool. And we'll introduce it. But I actually sat down and was like, all right, how could you do this? And, and while I'm playing, I'm like, there's got to be a way got to be away and i discovered the way and i'm like oh, how did i even miss that like it's obvious once you realize what it is yeah. i don't know I, achievements and iteration i i just would like to see more of it like i think this is why i like legacy games because that's what you get right like like charterstone except again charterstone hit that game three and it was like Bleh. i'm like <laughs> i, I want a slower yeah, a progression little, little like, more a little more dribble and less a little uh, more less... dribble um, again these feed them and freeze these fast forward games uh one of them is called something fruit i think it's called and it's like that you you play the game and you play it with like five fruit and play and then when you play game two you now have six fruit and play when you play game three you remove a really basic fruit and replace it by another one um an example of that you could do that with sushi go take like sushi go or sushi go party is probably a better example and put in like five really basic fruit right or sushi sorry really basic sushi that like whatever collect a set collect a run well put in the ones pairs. from the original set yeah, yeah. yeah. if you're and playing then, sushi, and then once you finish party. a game you swap one of those out for a new one right. now you're getting your iteration you're getting your onboarding all in one and you're getting possibly your easier setup because they tell you to do that at the end of the game before you put it away take this away take this away and shuffle there you just made it so the next time you play you just sit down and play there you go all right We've been going on, so we have. So I think that's going to be it for tonight's talk about things we would love to see ported over from video games into more tabletop games. Now, remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions every week. If you've got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. And now it's time to check in with the lobby and see our chat room here on Twitch to see if anyone here has anything to add to this discussion. All right, lobbyists, do you have anything to add? What video game elements would you like to see more of at the table? All right, I know you weren't getting all these, so I don't know if we have them all, but I know there's some good stuff in here. I, I wasn't I'm hearing it, but I was. I saw stuff coming coming through. There's been a lot. Um, Sorry, bad radio as we <laughs> scroll through our feed. So I know Darkling Blight was talking about uh, game apps and long-term support and essential, so, essential stuff, which is what we've talked about a lot of times. And yeah, that's see, they, yeah, just noting that what they are worried about with game apps is the app stop working, which is yeah. definitely a concern. I, I I just don't think that there's so much we could talk about with that. Like that could be well, a whole topic have. in a we way. We did a whole episode. Like we've that. mentioned, yeah, I don't, yeah, we did a long time ago, but it's it, times have changed. Um, I, I personally, I'm, I'm more in favor of apps than I used to be. Uh, so Darkling Blight mentions Seventh Continent has a save filter built in. You can save at any time. Owns it, but hasn't played it much. I have heard such good things about that game and people have recommended it very strongly to me, uh, but I have not played it. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, the uh, Ryan is, is talking about, you know, that virtual <laughs> tabletop. I, it's for me, Sorry. for me, virtual tabletops just don't do it i you know given the choice between there there's three options right you can play in person you can play or four right play in person play on zoom play on board game arena something designed to play that board game or you can play on tabletop simulator i would say there's five because then there's also digital versions of games like steam terraforming mars is very different than board game arena yeah fair oh yeah uh and and i think to me i'm gonna play either a digital version whether it's either the bga or the steam or i'm going to play in person uh and if i have to if there's no other choice i'll play tabletop simulator but i find it a poor experience now yeah. maybe in a, a vr world it would be better maybe, maybe. but 
Uh, it just, it's so clumsy. I, I have, you know, I have just found maybe, and, and maybe I'm just an old white guy, <laughs> but I, I don't find it easy to work. And I've used a couple of different ones. Um, and yes, there are some, you know, keystrokes and things to, to, to make things easier, but it's just, it just doesn't feel natural. Um, right. and, and, it, and that takes away from the game because you're focusing on the system around the game. You're not able to focus on the game system itself. And I think Deanna would agree with you. She really fights with Tabletop yep. Simulator. Yeah. Uh, so Roger pointed out Wingspan has an introduction demo, a special deck of starter cards. Uh, another example of that is Race for the Galaxy does that. There are a set of numbered cards in that game that you are meant to hand players as their starting cards. And if you wish, there's a walkthrough that shows you playing the first four of those cards. Now, as you're playing it, you're going to get more cards in your hand, and there's no reason not to just keep playing that game and finish it. Which leads to the other thing is you could also, after you've done that, stop and start over if you really didn't like being told what to do for your first four cards. Right. So, yeah, Wingspan has a demo built in that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, Darkling Bright did bring up Mystic Veil's customizable cards as being able to modify items in video games, which he was just a little ahead of us. That was before we got to talk about customizing things. Um, Roger was suggesting having a hand of cards, being able to level up, so possibly having multiple hands of cards. I got to say that sounds like too much work and confusing. Um, again, you could do any card game by just having multiple copies. If I have a copy of every card this card can turn into, I can swap it out, but just the, the physicality of even having to find those cards or sort them, let alone the cost of putting that many cards in a game. Yeah. Uh, so Ryan's talking about Mini's game years back where you built up the accessories as you play. I'm not remembering that off the top of my head, um, but I will point out the campaign-ish Warhammer games. So for example, More Time, where you play your game and you get to keep whatever you found and then your squad levels up and like everyone who was killed, you roll on a damage table and most of them are going to be fine, but some might be like missing an arm and then your stats change. So you did get that iteration through that style of game. Like more times, probably a really good example of a board game that iterates. Same with a, a Blood Bowl uh, league playing through a Blood Bowl league. You get that iteration. You get the, you're going to roll and every game's going to be different because of the rules for Nuffle at the beginning of the game. And your players get hurt and they roll on a table to see what happens to them. Blood, miniature games definitely do seem to be better at some of these things than board games are even. Absolutely. I mean, Blood Bowl, you've got the whole team progression and, you know, you level up your team and you can can, can get new cheerleaders and, and your ref, your coaches level up and your assistant yeah. coaches and your your uh, apothecaries. Um, you know, it. Blood Bowl is a legacy miniature game, <laughs> essentially. Uh, well, yeah, it's it's, it's a campaign game. I don't even know what you call them at that point. Uh, Ryan mentions Role Player Adventures has a keyword-driven branching narrative that could facilitate immersion. That does sound cool. I haven't played Role Player Adventures. Unfortunately, I haven't kept up on the Role Player games. That's because Tim Verling keeps promising me I'll get to, together, but we need to meet up physically and three years now <laughs> maybe next year we'll work with thunderworks games a little closer shipping to canada stinks as i learned again yesterday yep uh now ryan is saying virtual tabletops are a happy medium for distance play and i do agree like like it's awesome that it's out there Absolutely. we had some great space-based games on tabletop simulator and it's been a godsend for during covid times but i'd still rather play physically i mean it allowed us to uh get me enough plays of uh the roller coaster game whereas i wouldn't have yeah, been able fair to and unfair physically both. play fun fair and unfair without the tabletop simulator resistance out there but if an unfair uh module showed up on board game arena tomorrow i would oh, yeah. never again play it on tabletop simulator mm -hmm. ever um even if it was a bad implementation on board game arena i still probably wouldn't ever play it on ta on uh on tabletop simulator yeah. Because it's just, you know, if you're going to play it digitally, I want the benefits of a game where you don't have to worry about setup and you don't have to worry about yes. scorekeeping and all that stuff. Whereas, I don't want to have to hit R to shuffle the cards. And, right. You've and got you've got all the, the negatives, around. all the negatives of a physical game, uh, but it's in digital format with none of the benefits of the of the mm -hmm. digital format. 
and that's a frustration for me personally uh, on the tabletop simulator. So Tech says, I have a few games with game trays inserts and it makes it so much easier for setup and takedown. Again, game trays in particular seem to be very good at the, we're going to give you trays that are functional, not just for storing your game. Well, I mean, the Infinity Box is a great example yes. of, you know, and it took yeah, us an forever. Yeah. It took us forever to put it all together. But once it was done, mm -hmm. it's like, here, here you go. Oh, you want to play yellow? Sure. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. Yep. And, and Eclipse and, Second Dawn for the Galaxies and other. Yep. Yep. There's there's a few of those out there where uh, it's Rogers all just... calls out Wasteland Express Delivery Service. Yep. There's a good one. Yep. Uh, Ryan says, if there is or will be expansions, please accommodate that in the base box insert. That one's rough. Like, it is. honestly, companies don't know. Like, they don't know how well their game's going to do. So do you pay the additional cost to leave room for the expansion and the game flops? That might have done better if it was cheaper and had a smaller footprint? Like, that, that one's rough. I, I got to say, I hated it at first, but I actually don't mind the big box trend. And I mean, you look at a problem, you look at something like, again, a DC, uh, DC deck builder, uh, you know, the first box was of a size where you could get a couple more things in there, but they just kept putting out so many expansions. If they'd made the original box big enough for all the expansions, people would have been furious because you would have gotten this giant empty box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that one's a rough one. And, and I don't envy publishers having to make that choice. Right. So as an example, Stonemeyer right now has put up a survey. Anyone who plays Stonemeyer games might want to look at this. Asking, he said, I have no intention of making a tapestry big box. No, everything does not fit in the box, but it's big enough already. But if I'm wrong and you want one, please go on this survey because if enough people want it, I'll make it. Yeah. I like and one of the I think I think the the better solution to me that's working is uh what DC deck building did, what Space Base did is we're gonna put out an expansion box that has a little bit of extra. We're going to give you some mm -hmm. value in it, but its main purpose is now that we have a bunch of content, now we're going to let allow you to put it all together. And you don't have yeah. to buy it. If you've only got the base game, you're good. You don't need anything else. But if you are following along with our game and you are building up all this extra content, here, have something else that will now hold yeah. it all. And that's what DC did. That's what Space Base did. And I'm sure there's others I haven't run into that have done that as well, but those are those are the two that come to mind. Uh, and it's it's sort of a nice balanced solution, right? Uh, you are paying for it extra for it, but they mm -hmm. all they usually throw something else in there. Like there's you know with the multiverse box for DC, you got a multiverse expansion as well uh, as a lot of empty space that you could fill up with all your other cards. See what I would rather see, and I've only ever seen it once. And it was for core worlds from Stronghold games. And I think this is actually the perfect balance is the expansion comes in a box big enough to fit the expansion in the base game. And then if you put out another expansion, it comes in another new box that's big enough to fit all of it, which then, I think is better. You're getting the expansion anyway. You're going to have to store it somewhere. Why not have it come in that bigger box? But I guess, I mean, what if you only buy the third expansion? Then you've got, you know, it's... Uh, well, it depends on the game and if the expansions yeah. require the previous ones. Most do. Yeah, Quite true. a few games do require you to have the previous expansions. Right. Like, that was a game where the expansions were planned right from the start. And Stephen Bonacore made the decision, I want the core game to be small, to take up this much space so people see it and think deck builder. Because deck builders tended to come in a certain shape box that looks like a card box. Right. The expansion is your standard Kallax box right? Your standard board game Kallax box, and now both fit in there great. Like, actually, it, it came with a molded insert and all this stuff that wasn't in the original. I'm way happier about that instead of having to go spend $60 on a big box with a couple new cards in it. Yeah. Although, again, it depends It depends on the type, right? Again, with yeah. with uh, with with DC, you know, you get your, your core set has, say, 200 cards in it, whereas your expansions usually have, like, 50 cards in them. So yeah. it's it's kind of, you know building up and, and they're very much a mix and match where you don't need mm -hmm. to have all of them. Now, Ryan points out he having to throw plastic inserts away because they're functionally useless. Part of the purchase price included that insert. Again, it's in there to protect the stuff. You'd be even more mad if you spent less money, but got a damaged game. Yep. If all your cardboard tokens were pent and your rule book had a fold in it. Like again, I don't envy publishers having to make those decisions, but nope. People get so upset about the fancy flight inserts, but they're not there to organize your game. They're there so it gets to you undamaged. Yeah. 
which and, is mean, fair. Again, <laughs> remember these games are getting you know made and assembled in China, shipped across the world in a boat, thrown onto a truck, thrown into a warehouse, picked up by a forklift, put onto another truck, sent yep. to your board game, sent to your your store where some clumsy guy in the back is going to stock the shelves and then it's going to go to you and then it's going to get you know thrown in your back seat because you know you, you got to get out get home and then finally you're going to open that box and you need it to have survived yeah all those stages between... plus board gamers are obsessive about the box like like people get upset if there's a little dent in the box let alone the components inside well i just saw someone someone today was unboxing a copy of descent and as they took their plastic wrap off, it tore the side of the box off. <laughs> okay. Um, and Odd. and and it was you know they're horrified. I mean, and people are crying in their comments because uh. here you've got his box of descent with a torn box. <laughs> now, yeah, Deanna does agree with Ryan. If your insert sucks and I need to toss it to find my own way to store the game, I paid for that uselessness. Now, I'll admit, where I get upset is when you can tell it was meant to hold the stuff. And does a bad job of it right I, and i think that's again publishers trying to compromise right they want the game to get to you but everyone complains about the useless insert so we're going to try to do something yeah and like All you right. get some of those ones where the miniature is held in there but it like the sword is bent because it doesn't oh, yeah. actually hold all, all, all the miniature yeah you see that quite a bit yeah uh i don't know what cards that level up Deanna's talking about cards that level up i don't know I was scrolled up, so I didn't see it when it happened. Oh, I missed. Uh, oh, uh, some game that sounds super familiar. Cards to level up. I don't know. They said that one of the Ascension expansions had that. Yeah, no. but there's a reason a lot of people prefer to play Ascension than on the app. Well, the fact that you don't have to shuffle a thousand and twenty cards is yep, the main too. reason. Uh, they have Ryan saying that his impression of tabletop simulator is like playing games with salad tongs. Yeah, yeah. pretty close. Eight boxes of air. See, that's another thing, right? Shelf room is limited. See, that's the other thing we haven't even talked about is another big part of marketing games is shelf presence right. at the store, not on your shelf. Right. You can have the greatest game in the world, but if it's in a tuck box and it's next to Gloomhaven, Splendor. which one are you going to look at? <laughs> Splendor. You could fit Splendor in a box this big. No one will buy it at that price. Yeah. At, at, well, no one will pay the price of the chips because it's got those nice chips. Yeah, no, that's a that's a huge, a huge issue. Uh, and we're at a point now where, you know, you've got to have that Calax size, box size to to make a presence. And uh... yeah, now nowadays and people look for that size, right? Yeah, there's definitely a look. Yeah, OK, Ryan does make a good point about new additions. So, yes, uh, will there be expansions or not? So, you know what? I, I wonder how people would react if the new edition in game came in a different size box. I don't think I've seen it done right. where like the new printing is in now this giant box that fits the expansion. Well, I mean, unless, uh, unless it's a, a, a Kickstarter edition where you're, you know, the new box, the new second edition ha has a Kickstarter box that has all the expansions in it. Yeah, there is that. So Ryan was specifically talking about plastic inserts. He's not complaining about cardboard trench inserts of tech stuff. Why give me plastic? If you're paying for plastic plus an environmental aspect, right? If you're well, just yeah. tossing that out, there's a whole, don't need more microplastics. Yeah, don't ask for the shiny bits on your boxes either. Uh, <laughs> All right. I, I think that is the longest topic discussion we've had this year. <laughs> yep. I think we're going to move over to the coffee break because this has been empty for a long time. Yeah. Hello and welcome to our review of The Lost Ruins of Arnak. Does it live up to the hype? The Lost Ruins of Arnak was designed by Elwyn and Min. Yes, those are two names. It features evocative artwork from Jiri Kuss, Andre Hindra, Jacob Holzer, Francesc Sadik, and Milan Veronin, with graphic design by Philip Mermack. I do apologize for my pronunciations of some of those names. Now, this game plays one to four players, with games taking about a half an hour per player, but that's once you've learned the game. First few games will probably be a little longer than that. Now, Lost Ruins of Arnak was published in North America by Czech Games Editions, Sorry, Czech Games Edition. I'd like to forget which one's pluralized there. In late 2020 and has more award nominations and wins that I care to list here. As a very reasonable MSRP of 59.95 US. 
Even though this game came out during the pandemic, little has stopped it from taking the gaming world by storm. Mm -hmm. While the buzz about it has died down some now, it was riding a high wave for a very long time. Now, in Lost Ruins of Arnak, you lead an expedition to an uninhabited island in an uncharted sea where you found the traces of an ancient civilization. Searching dig sites, discovering new dig sites, battling the island's guardians, upgrading your equipment, discovering and utilizing strange artifacts and idols, increasing your knowledge, and documenting that knowledge for future generations. All of this is handled through a mix of deck building and worker placement. For a look at the very cool components you get in this game, check out our Lost Ruins of Arnak unboxing video on YouTube. Now, Lost Ruins of Arnak features some really awesome component quality and excellent graphic design. The boards are thick and clear, with worker placement spots being very easy to see. While I admit there is a ton of iconography, which can be overwhelming at first, it's actually all very clear once you learn what everything means. The artwork is as fantastic as it is fantastical, and the components are very tactile and a joy to play with. This is one game that, thanks to clear iconography and the player reference card, isn't too bad to pick up on Board Game Arena, though there are some aspects of play that don't emerge the same as playing it on the table, the group. Mm -hmm. Now, the rulebook is expertly written and is just as good for reading to learn the game as it is for referencing during play. Now, I will admit it would have been nice if the gold and explorer tokens, the compasses, were plastic like the other resources. I really can't complain about anything here. Honestly, it would be awesome if every game in my collection was lived up to the quality of Arna. Now that we have a rough idea of what we're getting, how about you give us an overview of play? So you're going to start by picking a side of the board to play on. You should start with the bird temple and try out the snake side when you have a few games under your belt. The snake side of the board is considered the advanced board game. And while it's not quite as big a difference as, say, flipping the board in Azul, it's not where I would want to start a new player off. Yeah, it's definitely more difficult and requires more pre-planning, I would say. Now, each player is going to take a player board and the components and their color, which includes the starter cards that are going to form their starter deck after you add two feared cards to it. You're going to shuffle that deck and draw your initial hand of five cards. Now, magnifying glasses and book tokens are placed at the bottom of the research track, which is then filled with random research bonus tiles. The temple tiles are placed at the top of the research track, and bonus tokens are placed on each dig site on the main board. Everything else, the various tiles and card decks, are shuffled and placed on the board in their appropriate spot, along with a nice storage spot for each of the resources in the game. You're going to add a number of artifact and item cards are then revealed to make the initial market at the start of the game. Players then receive starting resources based, based on the player order, and the game is ready to begin. As a new player, you will be overwhelmed mm. with the wealth of options in front of you. Even just trying to figure out which ones are available to you, to you and why or why not. That's normal and <laughs> part of the fun of this game. More options than you will ever be able to make use of. Now, the game plays over five rounds. Each round, players will take a number of actions, with each player taking one action at a time and the round ending only after all players have passed. Now, due to this, players will most likely not have the same number of turns in this game. More experienced players will often get multiple turns after newer players have passed, but it's a great learning experience to watch what the others are doing and see things you might have missed and options and directions you didn't even know you could play in. Now, each turn, you're going to choose between seven actions, which I'm going to summarize quickly. So first up, the, the kind of basic default action of the game is to dig at a site. You move a meeple onto an existing dig site, paying the transportation costs. Now, these transportation costs are important. Every card in the game provides one or more movement icons. A card used for movement is discarded after use. You don't get to use anything else on the card. Now, there's four types of movement. Walking, taking a car, taking a boat, or taking a plane. Now, icons can be downgraded to a lower version, so you can use a car instead of walking. You can also pay two coins at any point to charter a flight. That gives you one plane icon. Now, after paying the cost, you get what's shown on the site, whether resources, card management, like drawing or banishing cards, upgrading resources, and so on. I'm not going to be able to go into all the different bonuses you can get here. 
Now, there are three levels of dig site going deeper into the island, and the rewards get better the deeper you explore, but you can't go to a dig site that hasn't been discovered yet. Now, the base level of these sites that doesn't need to be discovered is your go-to action when you need resources and essential in your first turn. But each site on that first level is limited to only two meeple positions, while mm -hmm. all other sites can only have one meeple each once discovered. And even those initial, they call them the camp sites, will be limited with less players. Some will only be able to hold one meeple. Now, that leads me to the next action, which is discover a new dig site. This is going to cost you compass tokens. I like to call them exploration tokens. You're going to spend either three or six compasses and then, again, pay a travel cost. Now, you get an idol from the site immediately. You gain whatever bonus is shown on it. Now, idols are worth points at the end of the game, but can also be spent to gain an instant bonus, again, in the form of resources or drawing a card. Honestly, the use of idols, it can't be understated. It is a huge part of the strategy in this game. Now, after collecting your idol, you place a random site tile at the location and get the rewards on it. Mm -hmm. This tile is covered by a random guardian. If you don't overcome this guardian before the round ends, you will gain a fear card. Now, fear cards tend to just clog up your deck. They're worth negative points at the end of the game, but they are the cards you spend to walk anywhere. Now, speaking of overcoming guardians, that's your next action. Each guardian has a list of resources needed to overcome it. Take the action, discard the appropriate resources, and take the Guardian tile. Now, this tile is worth points at the end of the game, a significant number, and each features a one-time use ability that you can use at any time on your turn. You just flip your Guardian so you've done that. Also, the Guardians just look really cool. Yes. Uh, despite being what seems like a modern game, there are definitely some fantastical elements added with these Guardians. Next, your next option is to do some deck building. You can buy cards. You spend coins to buy any of the face-up items or compasses to buy any face-up artifact. Now, bought cards are instantly replaced. Item cards, when bought, are put at the bottom of your deck. Note that is a significant change for most deck-building games. Whereas artifacts actually happen right away. They get played and then go into your played pile. Now, items and artifacts are used later, like when they draw them in your hand, by using the play a card action. These cards provide a ton of different things that I'm not going to get into. There's a deck builder, right? You got all your different cards. You're going to be able to get resource, pay for travel costs, dig sites without workers, discounts on further purchases, and so on. No, artifacts are special, though, as in when they come up on your deck later. When you first get them, you get to use it right away. But when it comes up later, you do have to spend a tablet to be able to use it. And that's one of the resources in the game. And yes, you will forget to you need to use a tablet a few times. <laughs> yes. That is one you often have to remind people of. Now, both items and artifact cards are all worth victory points at the end of the game. Every card you buy is going to be worth points with the amount listed on the card. Now, remember, I mentioned this earlier, but just a reminder that all of these cards also provide transportation icons that will let you get to the dig, to dig sites. Of course, the struggle of whether to use a card for transport or its action is a painful one. Now, another action that can be taken on your turn is research. There is an entire branching research track that takes up the entire side of the board that's broken into a number of individual spots, many of which will have bonus tiles on it. To research, you're going to move your magnifying glass or book token up one tier by being playing the cost listed on the board. Now, if there's a bonus tile, you earn it immediately and do whatever it says on the top you then get the bonus printed on the board for the research tier you got to. Now, when doing this, you can't ever move your book past the magnifying glass. Now, what this represents is the magnifying glass is the physical act of researching where the book is documenting that research. The theming of this game and its actions really are strong, and it's one mm -hmm. of the aspects that I feel gets lost in online play, and that online game suffers as a result. Now, if you do manage to get to the very top of the research tack with your magnifying glass, you get a bonus tile. And now you can start purchasing temple tiles. Temple tiles are worth points at the end of the game, but cost a lot of resources. And the more resources spent, the better tile you get. All right, these rewards are, yeah, sorry. You work through all the research, and now it's really paying off. And I just want to pop me a pause here and say, welcome to all of our raiders. I just got a little yes. distracted and lost my place there. 
thanks for coming in uh, from James Chats. Hey, what? welcome, James. We rated James a couple weeks ago. I think this is reciprocal. So thank you, James. There we go. We are right in the middle of a review of Lost Ruins of Arnak. So we probably won't be interacting with the chat much until we're done. So sit back and enjoy the ride. So rewards for going up the research track are varied and include resources, drawing cards, discounts on buying cards, overcoming guardians for free, getting assistance, and more. The important one here is the assistance. Each assistant you get is an instant action that can be done at any time. Now, assistants are two-sided and can be upgraded by moving high enough up on the research track. Now, each assistant can only be used once per round. And during the game, you can have at most two different assistants. These rewards are one of the biggest differences between the sides of the boards, with the bird side giving you many more compasses or explore tokens to help you mm. out on those early and that early uh, early game. Oh, the snake, what hurts me the most is you have to spend idols to go up that track. I have other plans for my idols. <laughs> it's terrible. Now, of course, your final option is to pass, which you will choose if you're out of cards, workers, and resources that you want to spend. Now, the thing you won't get until you see the game played, and I'm going to kind of try to describe it here, is the way this all interacts and the way this generally works is that you're trying to take as many actions as you can on your turn. Bonus actions and resources play a big part of this, and trying to figure out how to get that one more resource so you can just go up that research track one more time to get that other resource that will now let you do that thing is what makes this game so enjoyable. It's sort of an engine builder of, uh, in a way where you're looking to take actions which will maximize your ability to take more actions on any given turn. And as well, one hopes at least, to help with future turns as well with the cards you may have purchased. I would definitely call this one an engine builder. This is an engine building game that uses deck building and worker placement. Now, at the end of each round, you're going to collect your workers. No, you're going to get fear cards for any guardians you didn't overcome. Your used assistants refresh, untap them. You get to choose one card you keep in your hand if you wish. Then you do a funky thing. You're going to shuffle your discarded cards and put them at the bottom of your deck. Then draw five new cards. Now this is a notable difference for most deck building games. Yes. That combined with the fact that when you buy an item, it goes to the bottom of your deck means that item is going to be near the top. And if you have ways to draw cards during your turn, you could purchase a card and draw it in the same turn. Next, you're going to do some cleanup stuff between rounds. The two purchasable cards, the one item and one artifact that are next to the moon staff, which is a piece that determines what round you're in, are removed from the game. The staff moves one to the right, and new artifact cards are revealed to fill the open spaces. Now, at the end of the fifth round, you're going to calculate everyone's scores. Now, this game is very much a point salad. You're going to get points for all kinds of things. The idols you've collected, the idols you haven't used, the guardians you've overcome, your progress on the research track, both for your magnifying glass and your book, any temple tiles you collected, as well as the points shown on all your cards you purchased. You then lose one point for every fear card still in your deck, and the player with the most points wins. Well, now that we've got a pretty good idea of how to play, let's move on to our thoughts about the Lost Runes of Arnak. Does it actually live up to all the hype and awards? Honestly, yes. I, this game totally lived up to all the hype. I would say for us, it was even better than all the hype. It, it, it outperformed the hype. Like, there's no way this game can be as good as everyone's saying. Not only was it as good, it was even better than everyone was saying. It's not often a game gets this much buzz, wins this many awards, and still manages to be just as good or better than the press, especially with our game group, because I've got to admit, a lot of these big, huge, popular games, we just didn't love, whereas this is definitely one we did. Just because a game has broad appeal doesn't mean it's for everyone. But in this case, it was absolutely, honestly, a perfect for our regular game groups. Yeah, I have to say, I really do enjoy it. Though the theme itself doesn't do much for me, the challenge of the game is very captivating. Yeah, so publishers, CG, A, A, G, ah, CGE, you really want to hook Sean, put out the sci-fi version of Arnak, <laughs> and we'll explore an abandoned space station. He'll be totally sold. There we go. Honestly, Arnak is just the right mix of game length, complexity, and replayability that we keep going back to it again and again. We're all actually currently playing a board game arena game of Lost Ruins of Arnak right now. 
Earlier when Sean messed, he might have been taking his turn. I don't know. <laughs> when he lost his place in the notes. And the physical copy we have hits the table at this point at least once a month, if not more. We also found this game great at all player counts, though I admit I prefer to play with at least three. Actually, all of all other plays, I think three is the sweet spot for us. Uh, the the three-player game is just significantly shorter than the four-player game. Now, again, this is not to say the other player counts are bad. They're not at all. I just happen to like it at three. Yeah, the game is on Board Game Geek listed as best at three. Mm -hmm. And of all the other player counts, four is the least recommended, though only by a small margin, more than likely due to play length more than anything else. Yeah, there's no real impact of the fourth player compared to three player on the board. Yes, you're going to compete more spots, but then more spots are going to get unlocked. Like it all kinds of balances out. But that added half hour to 45 minutes for the fourth player does kind of stretch into that. We're looking at the two hour game instead of an hour and a half game. Now, what I love the most about Lost Ruins of Arnak is, is the puzzle, the deduction, the puzzling out how to combine all of the various actions, the seven different actions, and all of the different bonuses you can get from taking those actions to get the most out of your turn. Now, this is an aspect of the game that's hard to describe without seeing it happen at the table. And honestly, it's the key part of being able to play this game well. But it is so rewarding when it works out just right. There's just a lot of fun figuring out that if I just explore this new spot, a new spot, a new spot, I'm going to get an idol. And then I can spend that idol to get that ruby I need, which is going to let me play this card that gives me this other resource I'll need that I can combine with the ruby to put me up on the research track to give me this movement icon that's going to let me dig at this site, which will let me then overcome the guardian at that site that I can then get used to flip over to dig at this other spot, which will get me, uh, you get the idea. That's a awesome turn in Arna. So this is a game where I see people comparing scores and trying and striving to reach certain score levels, often competing more against their past scores or aiming for specific goal score goals more than they are other players at the table. That's an interesting one. I'll admit I have not gotten to that level in Arnak. I, I couldn't even tell you what my average score is. I just like looking at the, we tend to keep, it comes with a score pad, and I tend to look back. And as long as my scores are going up, I'm happy. Now, we already kind of mentioned this a bit, but I am very impressed by the component quality here. And honestly, there's more going on here than you think. Like, I don't even mind the fact that two of the resources are cardboard, because those two resources and those only are the ones used to buy cards, whereas the other resources are plastic. Well, the plastic resources are used to either overcome guardians or do research. And it's also interesting to note that all the cardboard tokens you collect give you end game scoring points, whereas cardboard tokens you discard give you an instant bonus and then don't matter anymore. Like there's some real thought that went into the design of this game. that You don't realize until you sit back and go, oh, that's why those are cardboard or oh, that's why they're this way. And I think it's brilliant. And and this is, again, another one of those big details that you don't catch in online play. Now, overall, I think it's hard to deny that this game has really earned that laundry list of awards that mm -hmm. it has won. Now, I also found the game to be surprisingly thematic. What movement icons you need actually is based on the map of the island that's on the board. There's a big river in the middle where you need boats to go there. And it just makes sense that the deeper you get into the island, island the more icons you need. And then the way research works where you have to do the leg work and then document it, I think is awesome. Like that, that is one of the most thematic elements of the game. And then there's other stuff that, again, isn't necessarily obvious at first, but then just ties in really well. For example, the rewards you get for overcoming Guardian. Here you've got this giant turtle and you had to defeat and even what you need to defeat things even is tied in. Here's a giant bird and defeat it. You need an arrowhead and you need a plane. Kind of makes sense. You need to fly up there. But then you get to collect the bird token. And well, what's it give you? Well, it gives you any two planes so you can fly anywhere on the board. Wait, fly any. Are you flying the dang monster you just killed? How cool is that? So you obviously aren't killing the monsters. You're it is overcome easy. is the overcome. action. Overcome is the action. It's not kill the Guardians. The thought that went into this game is on so many levels is really an impressive design. Yeah. Now, this tie-in to theme actually makes Arnak surprisingly easy to teach to new players. 
like I'm not saying it's a basic gateway game here, but once I had the core rules down, I was able to give an overview and play in a very short time. And due to the fact that most of the information in the game at that first round is open, you only have six cards in your deck, so you know what five cards people have. Like, you know the possibilities. It is really nice to be able to teach key elements of the game as they come up. Like, I know you must have this and you must have this, so here are your options right now. And as we mentioned, the iconography is quite clear and mm -hmm. obvious. Now, the biggest problem with Lost Ruins of Arnak, right? It can't be all sunshine. It's that it can be intimidating. This is a big board. Actually, I should add a second one. It also takes up a lot of table space. I don't even know if this would fit on a three by three table. But ditching that aside, assuming you have enough room, it's a big board with lots of things on it, and it's covered with icons. And then during setup, you're going to cover up more things with more icons, including all these little tiny symbols, right? And then added to that are the number of options. Like there are seven options is not a small amount, but like which dig site to go to and which one to explore and which idols do you want to collect and how quick do you want to go up on the track? It's not often evident just how much you can do, even with a very limited amount of resources. The biggest hurdle for most players is learning, especially the research track works and how important progressing up it can be. Yeah, I'll go a step further and say it's downright terrifying for new players. I cannot imagine what a non-hobby gamer would think of if presented yeah. with this package spread out in front of them. Even as a gamer, I was pretty scared when first seeing it laid out and trying to figure out even where to start and that's with you. I mean, I've got the list of, of actions I can do. I know what all actions I can take. It's still really daunting. Yeah. Like I said, I, I would not consider this a gateway game. If I was going to introduce a new player, it would be a, with a bunch of other players who are going to be willing to help that player out. Because otherwise, it's not going to go well. Now, another problem I found with new players is they tend to focus on one aspect of the game. And generally, that's because everyone advertises this as the worker placement game and deck building game mashed together. And people tend to focus on one or the other. They focus on the deck building and they're working on buying cards to, to, to improve their deck, or they're all about getting their workers out to collect a bunch of stuff. The problem is that to play this well, you need to focus on all the things at once, as well as adapt your strategy to the changing board. Maybe right now the cards that are up buying aren't going to help your strategy and maybe placing your worker out isn't the best thing you could do because you could set up a whole bunch of stuff ahead of time to place it in a better spot. Which is probably why I still never won a game. <laughs> <laughs> That's possibly it. Now, what I do recommend with this game, not just with a gateway game or with any game or anyone new to the game, is the experienced players help out the new players. Don't play the game for them. That's terrible. You don't want a quarterback but point out action options that players may miss. When a player passes, say, hold on, don't pass yet. Look over at their player board and see what resources they have left. Have they forgotten they have compasses left and can actually use those to buy artifacts? Do they have enough gold to buy an item card? Do they have a worker left that they haven't placed? Did they have gold too? Did they forget you can spend two gold to charter a flight, which basically lets you get anywhere on the bottom two thirds of the board? Do they realize that they can spend their icons to get the resources they're missing and little things like that? And this is why you shouldn't learn online. Yeah. I learned more about tactics and idea of play in one single in-person game than I had in half a dozen online plays. Plus, there's the whole aspect of the, the different component quality and why they're that way is a huge thing. You're like, whoa, those are used to buy things. Oh, these are used to do things and stuff like that. Overall, Lost Ruins of Arnak is a fantastic game. It features engaging mechanics, a quick play time for the amount of depth, and fantastic components. It plays great at all player counts, and is a game we have returned to many times without getting sick of it at all. Despite all of that, I will say this game isn't for everyone. Despite being ranked the number two family game, this is a pretty heavy game. It's well above medium weight on Board Game Geek. And honestly, I agree with where it's sitting. It is a medium to heavy game. There are a lot of options and permutations to consider when planning your moves, and it really requires that ability to plan ahead. You're not thinking about one action. You're thinking about the seven things you can do to get one thing done. There are groups out there that are going to feel like this game is homework. 
that it is it is not fun. It's all about having to think and plan ahead. And that's not going to appeal to those type of players. This is not a game for people who suffer from heavy uh, analysis paralysis or are easily overwhelmed. Honestly, I don't usually have an opinion about Board Game Geek weights, but I feel like this one might actually be trending a touch low for where yeah. it actually sits. I can agree with that. Now, if you are okay with a game that makes you think and rewards you for puzzling out the best series of move possible, you're going to love Lost Ruins Arna. We found this to be a highly engaging game with a fantastic theme and tons of fun that also makes you feel smart when you play well. And that can't be overlooked. Like, that's just a good feeling when you're like, oh, I pulled off this thing. That's awesome. I can't believe that worked. No matter now, now separate from both of these, I, I have to say, no matter what kinds of games you are usually into, I would try to get in a demo of this. I would get to play a copy, go to a local game store, go to a demo night, find a friend who's got a copy and give Lost Ruins of Arnak a shot. This is honestly one of the most approachable medium heavy on the heavy side games out there. When you look at other games at that three weight scale, you're looking at some Vital Asserta games. And this is much more approachable than that. I have a feeling this for a heavier game is going to appeal to a rather broad range of game groups. And I got to say, despite any misgivings I've had, it really does live up to the hype. Now, before we wrap up, we do want to mention Lost Ruins of Arnak Expedition Leaders. Now, this is the first expansion for Lost Ruins of Arnak. It adds asymmetry to the game in the form of new leaderboards instead of your normal boards. Alternate research tracks for more replayability and bigger challenges, so worse than the snake. More guardians and new item and artifact cards with more potential combos and possibly even bigger turn combos where you do this to get that to do the thing. Now, I would love to tell you more, but I haven't actually picked up this expansion yet. Just like all of the buzz for Arnak, everything I have heard, seen or read about this expansion says it's fantastic and well worth picking up. Honestly, every time I share a picture of us playing Arnak, someone's going to comment saying, have you tried it with expedition leaders yet? You got to get it right away. Now, I will say at this point, it's high on the wish list. It's something we're looking to purchase. It really does sound like a solid addition to the game. Plus, you all know how much I love asymmetry. Well, that's it for our review of The Lost Ruins of Arnak. Before we go, I do want to invite you to check out our written review of this game over on the Tabletop Bellhop blog. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, so usually Tori and Kat come over on Friday nights. That's our game night. They come over, we play board games. Sometimes we do a little bit more, a couple other things, whatever. This week, though, um, we didn't. Uh, instead, we got together on a Saturday. Actually, the plans were to get together on Friday and Saturday, but that fell through. So we actually got together on Saturday, and instead of having a game night, we did a double date night. Uh, this involved hitting breweries and restaurants in Essex County and having some drinks and some great food and eventually heading back here. And then when we got back here, I was kind of hoping we'd play some games, but Tori forced us to play Mario Party on the Switch. If you are a Switch owner and a fan of Mario Party, uh, maybe. I I liked it on the N64, but I think games have evolved since then. <laughs> anyway, we played it. Tori won because, well, he knew how to play it before. Um, Deanna did surprisingly well for being asleep through most of the game. Um, my strategy was to go versus Deanna as often as possible, and that worked well enough to get me second, I think. So we played some Mario Party. Um, then I broke out Just Dance because neither Tori or Kat had played that. Deanna woke up and we took turns playing pairs in Just Dance and worked off some of the food we'd eaten. Um, that was quite fun. Then we moved on to Rock Band, which we played until the sun came up. Well, this was a ton of fun. There's not a lot to talk about here in tabletop gaming wise, of course, except Racco. That's right. More Racco at the Bandit Goose Brewery. This is now the thing we do. If we go to the Bandit Goose Brewery, we play Racco. And again, I sat down. Uh, we got there. First thing I did, we ordered drinks. People went to the washroom. I went and grabbed Racco off the shelf and we went and got a spot on the patio and I broke out Racco and Tori and Kat were like, what's this? I'm like, how? how? How do people not know what Racco is? Like, for me, it was just like a staple. It was like the game everyone owned or their grandmother owned or their parents owned. And it was just in the game shelf or in the game closet. So that was interesting. 
Um, I'm kind of shocked by that. Um, actually, we went so far as Deanna planned a a um, date night for us uh, where we were going to do a patio night in our own driveway, and she picked up a copy. So we can now bring Racco out to places other than Banded Goose. And well, after showing Tori and Cat Racco, they both agreed that this is one of the ultimate sit around, drink, chat, and hang out while playing a game games. So they've now bought a copy, which is in their luggage now to go with them camping. Of all the games to purchase, I don't think I would have put money on Racco to be on the list of new Bellhop's faves. Yeah, I, I, I'm shocked we're still talking, but it's the, you got to play it on the same patio. I know. I know. It, it is surprisingly good. It's it's that casual, you you can play while talking, but it's not just left, right, center. Like the, there are actual choices to be made and you, you will finish around going, oh, I shouldn't have put that there. Any game that makes me go, oh, I did that wrong. It, it, to me, is a good game. It's yep. a Racco. We're, this is we need to be sponsored by Racco. I mean, show up and like Racco, tabletop bellhop gaming podcast brought to you by Racco. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So we bought a copy of Racco. So like that, that that's one of our first board game purchases this year. No, that weren't gifts. Like where we sat down and so I had to go buy a game. Now, along with this, uh, D and I did try Scythe two player, so it wasn't a, a completely non video game week uh, or only video game week. Uh, I, uh, Scythe plays different, sober, uh, as to be expected. Um, we did try this two player. See, Snail Runs has never heard of Ragnarok. What is with people that don't know Ragnarok? Maybe it's a regional thing. No, because Tori and Cat grew up in this area, so I don't know. Anyway, uh, so Scythe two player. Now, again, played Scythe. Long time ago, a couple times, did not like it. Played a the longest game of Scythe ever. If you want more info on that, listen to our last episode. This is my first time playing two-player. Uh, second time Deanna's ever tried the game. Some thoughts on trying it two-player. First off, quick. Wow, are the turns in Scythe quick. Like, you have four? This shows how well I need. I mean, four options to choose from. And you're going to do the top part of the action and then the bottom part of the action. And at the beginning of the game, you can't afford to do the bottom actions. You're just doing one quick action was like move a couple things, generate some resources, gain some stuff on tracks. Kind of sounds like we're talking about the other game or build something. I think those are the, the possible actions. And and that's it. Like, that's all you have. And it's like, boom, 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 boom. It's like, all right, I move my I move two guys. Oh, I produce. OK, I'm going to build something with the stuff I produce. Oh, we're going to do this. And it's just like so quick. And, and it just felt like like we were done in half an hour. But then we looked at our watch and it had been an hour and a half. So it's it like totally had that. I guess I guess we were talking about flow earlier in the day. There was a bit of that going on. Like we kind of like the rest of the world disappeared and we were just playing side, which was kind of fascinating. Way quicker feeling than it actually is. But I wouldn't also say it was too long. Like it's not like we're like, oh my God, it's now one in the morning. It was like, oh wow, okay, that took longer than it felt like it did. Another interesting thing that happened in this game, zero conflict. Uh, we did not get into one fight at all we did not fight each other we didn't have to use the combat dials nor did we even steal resources from each other like we didn't even scare a farmer away so that was kind of interesting just for every other game i played as had direct conflict um i will say that deanna probably wasn't playing that well since her faction was i can get stars for more than two fights and she didn't fight but i think we had a whole cold war thing going on where like we were worried each other would win i don't know uh so the big thing with Scythe is there is a lot going on. Um, in a way, I'm not looking forward to reviewing Scythe later because like I talked about the actions in Arnak and that took a while to get through. There's a lot going on in this game and it is really easy to forget some of some part. Like it's a big machine with lots of cogs and it's easy to forget one cog. Uh, for example, D kind of forgot the factory in the middle of the board. She like like the yeah, the spots there, but totally forgot that if you move your character, note your character, not your mechs and not your workers. If your character explores the factory, you get this set of cards. You get to pick one of them, and now you have another action you can take. And most importantly, that action has a move on the bottom half. It is the only way in the game to get to a move action two times, like to get to move twice in a row, because you always have to move your pawn. It's the villainous thing. Uh, no one faction breaks that rule, but being able to move twice in a row is huge. 
Um, she also, I'm not sure she forgot it or not, but also didn't seem to remember that it counts as three spaces. Now, I'll admit, this is a mistake I made the first time I played Scythe and got decimated because I totally didn't, I thought I owned the most of the board and I didn't realize the middle spot counted as three. Now, on my hand, I totally realized that you don't need Riverwalk to get to the factory. And I would have sworn after my first three plays that that was the only way to get there. And I totally realized this game that you don't need Riverwalk to get everywhere. And it's really simple. All you have to do is build a tunnel and then you can use your tunnel to go anywhere. But like, I totally missed that. The first time, three times we played, it just seemed like, well, everyone has this ability and you're going to have to unlock that pretty early in the game or else you're not going very far. And I was totally wrong. And I got to say, it's it's fascinating that I'm now personally four games in. Yeah, four games. In. I played two, two with the tropes, one, one, one game that I'm still discovering things in the game. Like all this stuff was presented to me, but just the way they interact and the way things uh, work with each other. So, so the thing is, beside that I'm definitely seeing here is this is one of those games that takes a few plays to grok. This is not a one and done. You are not going to get the scythe experience on your first game or possibly your second or even your third game. And honestly, that's going to turn some people off. Now, this has tons of hype. So I think most people realize this, but like no one told me just how much is going to be going on and how there's no way in one or two games you're going to be able to figure all this out. And even Jamie put it in the rule book that, that, hey, the best way to learn this game is just just do things and find out. And he's right, because I'm still four games in, like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I don't need Riverwalk. Which part of me is like, well, that's flipping obvious. You just do your tunnel. I, at this point, side though, is the living proof that who you play with can matter as much or more than the game. I am finding way more to like about this game than I did in my first two plays. It is definitely growing on me. Big thing now, of course, is to play it with more than just Deanna and I and sit down with more players. All right. Well, I again, I, I've gotten, I, I played Scythe once digitally on the, the, the it's a, yeah. the Scythe game uh, from Asmodee and I didn't understand it at all. It made no sense to me whatsoever. And I have never, I uninstalled it and have never looked at it again. <laughs> See, if I own that, I'd try to show it to you, but yeah. even then, it's going to be rough. One you're going to have to play when you're down. All right, well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right, so with the pile of obligation almost empty, it really is close. I actually spent a couple days this week uh, responding to pitches and pitching publishers. Now, as of right now, one new game, The Ghosts Betwixt, is on its way. Uh, actually, I really know this is on its way because it's currently stuck at the border because I know because I just had to pay tax and duty and brokerage fees on it. Um, nothing else was finalized, so I don't want to announce we're getting something else or we're going to review something else in the future. But I do expect some new games to be headed this way. So it's been a while since we've had anything new. Show up. Also, this past weekend was free RPG day. Uh, we stopped in at the CG Realm and while there grabbing RPG stuff, we did pick up the Charterstone Recharge Pack, which I mentioned at the top of the episode. Now, again, since this one is not an obligation, I think it's going to take a bit more time to get through as we're not going to be rushing to get our review out. We're not going to be trying to finish the campaign as quick as possible. Not that we really rushed Charterstone, but like there were nights where we played three games, which I probably would have only played one. Now, I'm sure I'll be sharing my thoughts once we start and as we play in the usual spots, including here on our podcast. As for what I plan to play, so we've got a bit of a drought going on as far as board game groups. Tori and Kat are gone for two weeks. So it's Deanna and I and the kids. Um, for Deanna and I, I do have a Porte and Twilight Struggle on deck to play with Deanna. Um, and with the kids now done school, we're talking about maybe a return to Hogwarts. But again, nothing set in stone for what we're going to play before next week. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests. Our Patreon backers, we greatly appreciate their support. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle and Owen Thomas, thank you both. John P. Kelly, congratulations on the wrap-up of your fantastic podcast. It will be missed. Andrew Dacey, thank you, Andrew. Brian Van Beek, thanks, Brian. Well, that was the double bell. 
That means our shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us at TabletopBellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice under Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Show your support at Patreon.com slash Tabletop Bellhop and sign up for awesome bonus content, including bonus audio, access to our pre-production show notes, and behind-the-scenes blog posts. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us, and I invite you to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.